Hello, everyone. I can't hear you. Hi, Ivana, we do hear you, yes. Ah, okay, great. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, Dina. Hi, how are you? Good. I hope Jody, Jody has some problems with joining. She's here. I don't know what is the issue with turning on the audio and video. She's here with us. I think we should uh, let her as a panelist or as a host. She's the panelist. We made her a panelist. Uh -huh. I don't know. Where is the problem? She's getting disconnected often. Uh, I see her getting disconnected and joining back. It's because she wrote me that she is not allowed to uh, start speaking or use video. So No, we just like we have done for all the other speakers, we are letting her in. It's just that she's getting disconnected. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that Jody has option to speak because I don't see the microphone on her screen. Okay, now I see. Now we have two Jody. Hey guys. Hi. Hi, Hi Jody. My Zoom is being so strange this morning. I have this whole camera set up here and it's not working on my normal computer. So I'm using a backup computer. And restarting computer would work. You can try that. I tried. I just, I'm not sure why it's being funky. It just says not responding. All right, so it's nine o'clock and we have everyone here so we can go ahead and get started. If anyone has any questions during the session, please write in the chat or raise your hand and I'll be sure to address everyone. All righty, so today the goal of our panel is Global Youth Networks. And so during this discussion, we have a few amazing speakers and we're gonna discuss about some actions and strategies about how YLN, which is the Youth Leadership Network and World Academy of Arts and Sciences can work together with all your organizations to take the next steps in uniting all these global fronts. So I wanna introduce a few speakers that we have on our panel today and they're each gonna give about a five minute intro and then from there, we'll dive into some deeper questions. So why don't we start with you, Frederica? Oh, hi, everybody, and thank you, Jody. Uh, I'm delighted to be, to be here today and have the opportunity to participate in this important event. 
and discuss the strategies that we should implement in order to build uh, this global uh, alliance. Um, before starting, I would like to briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Federica and I am partner of Field Leadership Network. And recently I became junior fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Science. And also I am the president of a committee uh, of the Italian Federation of Human Rights, uh, whose goal is to spread the knowledge about human rights, uh, monitor their violations, uh, and um, create awareness in public opinion. So uh, regarding the topic of discussion of today, I think that we are all on the same page and we all believe that uh, uh, youth must be integrated more into the multilateral system at the local, uh, national and international level. And uh, we know that uh, um, um, at the end of the year 2030, which is the deadline for the Sustainable Development Gold, um, the number of youth is expected to grow by 7%. And according to that, I think that uh, youth must be integrated and involved in the formulation of political and social um, policies and frameworks. Um, the new generations are the driving force of change. But I think that uh, in order to promote youth development, uh, it's necessary to build a very strong and active network. And uh, from my point of view, networking mustn't take place randomly, but uh, um, according to specific strategies that I would like to, to suggest. Uh, first of all, I think we need to, to focus on the right people. And with the right people, uh, I mean, the people who believe in the same values and in the same objectives, because I think that networking is not just simply um, connecting people, but it's something more, because it's connecting people with people, people with ideas, and people with opportunities. Secondly, um, in order to build a powerful network, I think that youth organizations uh, must be able to clearly communicate three things, uh, who they are, what they are doing, uh, and what they want to achieve. Because if you think uh, all organizations uh, know each other and are composed of people, young people who are like-minded uh, and are driven by the same ambitions, uh, I think it's easier to promote their dialogue. And so, understand the bigger picture, pictures of the challenges that, that we are called on to face. Uh, thirdly, um, with the aim of encouraging dialogue, commitment, and create this global alliance, I think that we should uh, um, maximize the use of platforms and IT tools that uh, have been implemented in the modern world, especially after the, the spread of the pandemic. And I think uh, that uh, uh, the employment of these tools uh, um, allows youth to express their message, uh, to reach the largest number of people, and therefore um, bringing uh, um, awareness and empowerment of the next generations. So these are the strategies that I would like to point out during this panel. And uh, I wish to conclude my short speech uh, uh, by saying that uh, it's um, evident that uh, the societal change also passes through networks. And when networks mature um, into an effective community where all people, where all its participants think and act collectively, uh, I think that we can achieve important and powerful results. So this is my message. And uh, as I mentioned to you, Jody, uh, I'm not be able to stay for, for the rest of the session, unfortunately, due to a uh, working commitment. But uh, I promise that I will be with you in, uh, in spirit. Uh, and I really hope to see you soon in the next uh, event. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Federica. If you want to post your information in the chat, that would be great. That way people can follow up with you after. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again. Great. Thank you. We're going to continue. And Federica made some really great points about how the youth population is growing by 7% and how we have to get more specific 
with networking in order to create this global alliance. So I'd like to turn it over to Dina, who's fellow team member of mine for the YLN Leadership Network, and just hear a brief introduction about yourself. Um, again, introduction, five minutes, just a little bit about your organization. And then in the second half, we'll dive into the deeper questions and strategies. So Dina, please take it away. Thank you, Jody, and thank you everybody for being here today uh, and for us to discussing this important issue. Uh, I'm Dina Dragia. I'm from Croatia. I'm one of the founders of Youth Leadership Network, also a junior fellow of World Academy. I have a background in international relations and diplomacy and in anthropology. And YLN serves as a bridge between uh, young people and decision makers. Uh, today, I'm speaking on behalf of YLN. And I will extend the idea about the digital platform that Jody already mentioned at the GL21 conference. Uh, also, Federica mentioned that it was amazing that uh, platforms are important, and we do agree. Uh, we as well and think uh, that about if we want to create a global alliance, we think that uh, nowadays transparent and free communication through online platform is one of the necessary ways of networking, especially in these uncertain times of pandemic that prevents us from face-to-face -face interactions. And that is why we decided to provide a concrete solution by presenting our application and a platform that is designed to create a global alliance among civil society and decision makers, and also to connect youth worldwide in a short time. So our main idea is to enhance the voice and power of youth and civil society in global and national decision-making through quick and transparent online networking and sharing ideas. And I will briefly describe our application by sharing the screen with you so that you can see. And I apologize, I apologize in advance if I'm not able to share my screen. I will try. Sorry. Okay, I think I'll make it. Can you just confirm, is it my screen visible? Can you see my screen? We see that you are sharing, but we see only a black screen. Okay. So <laughs> let's continue. I'll try one more time and if it doesn't work, I'll just continue. Just a second, sorry, sorry for this. Jody, <laughs> is my screen visible? Let's, no, it doesn't, sorry. Okay. Okay, I'll just continue then. Uh, it's about the application, as I said, and while I suggest creating a social network uh, app based on audio chat and forum chat uh, that gives equal voice to all and connects people from same and different fields in forging a global alliance of united projects and ideas, ones that is similar to a clubhouse. Uh, but we decided to go even further and to develop a platform where online discussions among civil society and decision makers is a main focus. And it is important to emphasize how this is not a platform uh, designed for random comments or random discussions or spreading one's ideologies, uh, but one for transparent communication on logical solutions. And therefore, even if this application will be open for everyone, a person joining has to register with providing a valid ID and accepting the terms of use. And by accepting the terms of use, person accepts to share evidence-based data avoids discriminatory speech and personal ideology, and agreeing in recognizing herself in values such as unity in diversity and mutual respect. Uh, each person that registered will have a verified profile with name, surname, date, and place of birth, area of interest, biography, and private chat would also be possible, similarly to LinkedIn page. Uh, the application will have a world map. And by clicking to a specific country or a state, you can start or participate in a discussion about that particular place. Uh, for example, Croatia was hit by a devastating earthquake recently, and people would be able to click on Croatia and to discuss that topic into details. 
uh, or you can just search for a place or a topic on searching options, similar to Google, Google search. And besides platform, we'll have a possibility of data collection, which is very important, uh, data collection of specific concerns through organized questionnaires. And the last and maybe most important part is that the app will have a section with board of mentors, senior officials, current decision makers, verified experts and investors that could directly turn ideas into action and to enhance the voice and power of youth and civil society in global and uh, national decision making by promoting their ideas and also to closely working with them on those projects. And to sum up, uh, I would like to say that Wyland believes that well-organized online networking will secure global alliance, will promote unity and diversity, and will present how thinking independently together is possible. Uh, we believe that this is a platform uh, which is very important because decision-making processes are usually exclusive. And we think that this application is able to secure more inclusive uh, global and united leadership. Uh, we already spoke to agencies that could realize our idea. Uh, but we would love to continue our work together with the United Nations and World Academy. Unfortunately, you cannot see the screen, but uh, the name of our application is World United Leadership. Uh, w referring to World Academy, U referring to United Nations, and L referring to YLN. And uh, when we speak about World Academy and how World Academy could help, uh, we believe that through mentorship programs that young leaders mentioned yesterday, uh, and by assisting in helping networking with people that could help us developing and financing our application and also by using and promoting that same application. And I hope soon we are all going to use this app and connect globally in just one click. And now if you allow me, I'll just try <laughs> to share a video from a video with you uh, one more time. And if it doesn't work, it's okay, but I would like to, for you to see. Let's hope it will work. Is it working? It's not working. No, we yeah, just the see audio. The we don't see the video. I'm sorry. If, if you could put, share the link to it in the chat, then people can watch after. No, it's like, um, I don't have a link, but uh, Jody, I can send it. So at the end, maybe you can just show it. Sure. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks so much, so Dina. I'm sorry for this. No worries. There's always some technical difficulties on Zoom. I had some signing on. Um, so we're going to continue again. We're just doing five minute introductions, trying to learn a little bit more about our panelists before we dive deeper into the strategies and actions. So let's continue now with Vanessa from the POP movement. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, hello, everyone. I am really happy about being part of this honorable planning panel representing the pop movement. And thank you so much to the World Academy of Art and Science and Youth Leadership Network for the opportunity to contribute to creating a strong global youth network. Um, I am Vanessa Hernandez, pop youth mentor, and I have been working as a mentor in the pop movement since two and a half years. I hold a bachelor's degree in chemist and chemistry pharmacist and biologist. One of my particular interests is climate change and the effects on global health. And I am currently based in Mexico, and I love to create opportunities for youth lead climate action projects. Um, well, I would like to share a little bit about the POP movement. And so POP stands for Protect Our Planet. POP is an organization that aims to empower the youth to have an active participation in addressing issues of climate change. Within the POP movement, we work alongside different organizations, companies, institutions, and governments from more than 70 countries. Since we believe that the impacts of climate change will not affect a single country and will affect everyone in the same way. We believe in ourselves, the power of the youth of the world to unite and face this challenge together. The time to act is now and we inspire youth by knowledge, creating capacity building. We have seen that there is a need to bring billions of young people together to address climate change so that in the future they could become sustainable thinkers in whatever profession they develop. Um, there is an immense need to link all the youth associations, organizations, and most importantly, each young individual. And we work to provide them a platform where they can share their action, their projects, 
and integrate activities, mobilize a collective efforts, share knowledge, and share what they are doing to address climate change. We provide a platform for young people, including minorities, indigenous, tribal communities, among others, to showcase and share their work on climate action, giving them the opportunity to look for investors or present it to governments and private relationships to take the project on a large scale. It is also thought that young people reflect and learn from other young people from different parts of the world and, the, and to create a networking platform to continue with inspiration on protecting our planet. We connect young people with experts to create more opportunities for them. And we believe that to create a global network, we need sustainable partnership, practicing empathy, communication, love, respect, and transparency, empowering relationships, building capacities for equity and inclusion. And we look forward to work together with um, all of you. And we are really happy about being participating in this global panel and to start making this great collaboration between young organizations. Thank you so much, Ruby. Thanks for sharing that, Vanessa. Um, and so we're gonna continue as well. And we are our next speaker is from the, he's a founder and executive director of Emancipate in Indonesia, and that is Marjianta. I hope I pronounced your first name right. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Jody. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Gian, uh, and I'm the founder and executive director of Emancipate Indonesia. We are a nonprofit organization uh, that was established in 2017 that focuses on modern slavery issues. So we focus on child labor issues. Uh, we focus also on the, uh, the welfare of the young workers, the working class of young people. And of course, um, forced marriages and forced sexual exploitations as well, and encouraging ethical uh, con consumption for people to be more aware about the product that they're buying and the effects to these people, and not only people, of course, but of course, uh, to our environment as well. Um, aside from Emancipate Indonesia, uh, where, which, uh, where uh, I, I lead the organization to do research, advocacy, campaign, and, and trainings, um, I'm also, uh, I was also part of the Youth Advisory Panel for UNFPA Indonesia. So we're basically advising the UNFPA Indonesia, the United Nations Populations Fund, to actually engage with the government stakeholders from high-level meetings in order to make um, sustainable and meaningful youth engagement uh, in policymaking, um, as particularly on sustainable development goals and what can we do about it as young people. And I was recently also have been the social media ambassador for Amnesty International Indonesia, promoting uh, human rights um, and social justice as well. Um, uh, and also I'm the spokesperson and co-initiator of the youth movement for FCTC, a framework convention on tobacco control. We're focusing on a youth participation to tackle uh, tobacco issues in Indonesia, um, especially um, um, in regards in the perspective of global health. So it's not only about changing people, how to make them stop smoking, but also to demand accountability from the corporations, from the big tobacco corporations that are actually taking profits uh, from this addiction of young people nowadays. So basically in general, <laughs> I think I'm a generalist in a way. I work in human rights issues, children's rights issues. I, I was also a children facilitator since 2010 and the Minister of Women Empowerment and Children Protection in Indonesia. Um, I'm also, I recently also work with UNICEF as well for their global program on youth movement to tackle non-communicable diseases. But also I have passion in political economy. I used to work at Indonesia for global justice as well. It promotes a trade uh, that is actually, uh, you know, against uh, the uh, free trade agreements. That actually, we think that free trade comes along with multilateralism, but sometimes they just uh, drive our labor laws, environmental laws into like almost non-existent. Uh, so I was also advocating for that. Um, also with the labor movement, uh, also with the health movement. Um, so basically I'm a generalist. Uh, uh, just uh, ask me whatever you like, maybe I can answer, but maybe uh, that's me in a nutshell. I'm, I'm looking forward to engage more with uh, all of you here. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Great, thank you for that. We're gonna continue on and um, we're gonna do an introduction by Elena. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jody. Hello, everyone. Um, hello from Ukraine, from Kyiv. And I'm really glad to be part of this panel today. I followed several of the panels before, and I know that uh, youth uh, participation issues, youth leadership, 
uh, and youth inclusion uh, topics have already been discussed. But I think that today we uh, would like to focus more on the network of networks, yes, on this global, uh, globalization. So first, several words about myself. Uh, I'm the director of the uh, private Ukrainian foundation based in Kyiv, Ukraine, uh, that uh, provides non-formal education uh, program for young people uh, from 20 to 35 years. And our programs are mainly for uh, those uh, young activists who want to take active role and take active part in the development of the country and in transforming it. Because as uh, you know, Ukraine passes through the uh, time of transformations as the rest of the world, but in our country it is more uh, um, urgent and uh, different systems and different fields are being changed from education to science to healthcare system, etc. So uh, our foundation uh, works with those young people who are really active and who take uh, their responsibility on their own future and the future of their countries. Uh, the biggest program of the foundation is called Young Generation Will Change Ukraine, and as you see, the, na the name is self-explicit. Uh, we give different instruments and uh, possibilities for these young people, for the selected young people, to study how they can implement, uh, implement changes and how they can uh, use the best European and world experience and bring it to Ukraine. So we act since uh, uh, 2010 and the visionary uh, of our foundation was the past uh, member of the World Academy of Art and Science, Dr. Bogdan Havrilishin, who was also a member of the Board uh, of Trustees and was one of those core people who uh, helped think about the uh, global future. So I'm, I'm really glad to be the associate member of the World Academy of Art and Science. And I'm also part of several other uh, global networks, uh, like I'm the member of the uh, Kiev Multinational Rotary Club. As you know, this is a huge global network. And that's why I have some ideas about the functioning of uh, well-known and effective networks. Uh, in our programs, we usually accept young people who are active, patriotic, ethical, so they uh, correspond to several uh, standards and they usually are uh, representatives of the other networks. And I think that this principle could be applied also to building an effective global alliance of uh, ne other networks so that each uh, junior fellow of the academy, each active member of the academy of young age is already a part of some network or networks. And this is very important to uh, bring those networks each member of the academy and junior fellows are connected to and also to uh, finish my short introduction i would like to mention several uh, in instruments that are used in ukraine to enforce uh, youth participation uh, namely the youth delegates to the un program uh, as you know only 40 countries in the world out of around 200 uh, present at the UN have their youth delegates. And this is a strong recommendation to start such a program in your country. I'm sure that you have your youth delegates, but there are still lots of countries that don't. And I'm happy to uh, say that our foundation was one of those who helped launch and establish this program in Ukraine together with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, with the Ministry of Youth uh, and Sports. And till now, uh, the, the foundation coordinates this program uh, and finances it. Uh, this is the practice of our country, and it is one of the best uh, eight that are in the guide uh, guideline for the youth delegates in the world. So 
this is an important instrument to ensure youth delegation and to uh, involve young people in the decision making pro uh, process uh, on the global level. So for now, this is it. Of course, I have some thoughts about the building of networks, and I think we will pass to this later. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. And we're going to move on to our final introduction, and that is Ivana. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I hope you hear me well. Uh, my name is Ivana Lazarovsky, and I'm from Serbia. Since uh, 2017, I've been a junior fellow of, of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, by vocation, I'm a political science, uh, scientist and uh, specialized in the international security studies. Environmental security is my, uh, my master's degree. So um, I want, wanted to share uh, thoughts with you on the connections, on the connecting of the, of, the, of the youth leaders. So as you all know, we live in the era when it has never been easier to connect, uh, to share knowledge, ideas, perspectives. So it is not really about how can we connect youth leaders, but rather what are the bases of, of our interactive work and what are the values and principles connecting our future leaders. Uh, therefore, in order to make a strong alliance of future leaders that will be able to guide us to the better future, we need to gather around very precise set of values and principles that each one of us uh, will be ready to protect, to fight for, and to respect without exception. Uh, so this set of values needs to be communicated um, among the prestigious uh, alumni networks and the youth movements. Um, and that, that is actually, as you all know, uh, uh, alumni networks are networks of the prestigious universities are one of the strongest uh, youth uh, leadership uh, networks. So it is really about how are we going to advocate for the, the, the strong values that we are going to build, build and that will actually work as a glue for uh, all the youth leaders willing to, to make changes in the future. So today I would like to discuss a couple of, uh, of uh, values that I think are the essential to build up a mission that will uh, lead us towards a um, world in common and, and uh, common goals. So that's it. And I, let me know when I can, uh, where, if I can tell them now or I can, or should wait a little bit more when we start the discussion. Great. I think um, that's actually a great place to start. And so now that all the audience members and the panelists have gotten to know each other a little better, I don't know about everyone else, but I'm so blown away to be even sitting with all of you and hearing each of your different introductions from all over the world. You can tell everyone is involved in so many different groups and we're all sitting here today for a reason. So let's hopefully turn this conversation now into more action steps. Um, and as Dina mentioned, we're both a part of the Youth Leadership Network. And so our main goal with World Academy of Arts and Sciences is to have these conversations that hopefully assist you guys to our best of our ability to create these global alliances. So I really would love um, to kind of ask each of the panelists certain questions based on their introductions and their backgrounds. And please feel free to write again in the chat and I will address these questions as well. So I think it is very important that Ivana just kind of brought us back to the basis here. And with so many different people around the world trying to connect and make glue for everyone with values and ethics and little things like this, I'd love to you know, start your next five minutes, Ivana, with what are your thoughts on how do you get people united under the same values when we all come from different cultures and different places in the world? Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, uh, leaders need to, need to act in an ecologically conscious and responsible manner. And how do we pursue this, uh, this principle? Uh, simply by making a number one principle of the youth leadership network, that all the actions, projects, perspectives of the network are 100% aligned with the Paris Climate Agreement, for example. So, there would be a checkup. If, there is a proposal for action. It has to be 100% aligned with the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. 
uh, my second thought would be that all the perspectives of the youth movement are embodied within the Sustainable Development Goals program of the United Nations. And third, the uh, proposal would be that the development, that the only development policy that will be able to save us from a major economic existential crisis, which is quite close, I would say, has to be built on the principles of the green growth and green economy. So we would not want to be engaged in other types of uh, development. Uh, fourth, and very important one, uh, especially from uh, for the political science uh, scientists, uh, students, and I think uh, we have to have a very strong advocacy for the transition of the concept of the sec of security from military to human and environmental notion of security. How so? A uh, global pandemic crisis of coronavirus has proven that enormous uh, confronted military capacities are no longer adequate protection or sol nor solution to the challenges we are facing today. So this has to be very important part um, of, of our program. Uh, fifth, I need, uh, we need to um, develop, uh, we need to develop our programs with the transdisciplinary perspective and integrated knowledge in order to achieve the highest potential of the existing knowledge. And last but not least, the paradigm of the future leaders needs to be understand, uh, needs to understand and highly respect existing uh, diversities as, uh, as our one of our greatest potentials and values. So these are the principles we need to uh, follow and uh, advocate for and uh, in order to um, complete the mission which will construct the world in common that will be able to protect uh, people, uh, our planet and peace. So as you all know, as I said in the beginning, we can easily connect nowadays and uh, from all around the world, but it is really about uh, the, the values that will make us very strongly connected and uh, uh, our alliances need to be built on, on the values that I have just um, promoted I, I'm sure there are much more of the of the points that I that we can discuss but um, these are some of the thoughts that I think should be the 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 principles of the youth leadership network that can later go on while we make alliances with different uh, networks and uh, that's it great thank you so much for starting that framework for us um, I'd like to turn it over to Dina now. As Ivana was talking about the principles and values and the five different steps we can take and get this baseline, especially with COVID-19 and all these different things that are happening around the world, it seems that each country or city is acting individually and independently. And so Ivana did a great job of highlighting just the similar principles that we all need to have and being accountable for and checking in on proposals to make sure that we are still that united front. So I'd love to bring in the youth aspect of that. And as she mentioned at the end with the Youth Leadership Network, that is our goal. So I'd love for you to chime in on your thoughts in steps on how is this member sign up in the app and how does this all connect and how do we make sure that we stay consistent with these values and principles that Ivana just mentioned? Uh, I would just like to start with saying that uh, Kiwalan uh, has only one uh, race and that is human race and we respect everyone. And this platform is also open for everyone. And also uh, what is very important that, that we will uh, translate uh, directly so that everyone who maybe doesn't know uh, every language can also join and uh, we will have uh, open discussion so the same as YLN is uh, opening their our doors for everyone that wants to join uh, but I would like to also say as Ivana pointed out uh, the mindset of the people the values that we are living are important and we have to just understand that we are all together in this world and that we have to fight together for a better tomorrow even though we are separated by cultural backgrounds and me as anthropologist i would like to emphasize that uh, all of us in wildland 
we respect others, we respect other cultures, and we are showing mutual respect. And that will be shown in our platform also uh, by just opening doors to everyone and uh, being kind of here for those who would like to, uh, for us to be their voices. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, I like to bring it over back to Vanessa and um, a lot of what you were saying in your introduction is how, how you present and how do you connect with government officials and actions and experts and really taking the climate change movement that you guys are doing at the grassroots level, but bringing that to the higher leaders of your country, of your cities. So if you could just walk us through your process and how you know we can start to understand what's the best way to get to experts, government leaders, connecting people from grassroots all the way to the top, that would be great. And then I'd love if you could tie that back onto World Academy of Arts and Sciences and YLN with some recommendations about how we can move forward doing that same strategy. Well, thank you so much, Judy, for um, for your introduction and, and for explaining more about the important high, like the points that I should highlight. Um, so, well, within the pop movement, um, in these two and a half years that I have been working as a mentor, I have identified um, some human values that are important to care of. And while we are working on creating partnerships with institutions, organizations, governments, companies, communities, I have identified some key items that I think that we need to improve and care of. So I would like to share like these important items um, that could be taken uh, into account to for to all the organizations and to the World Art of Science, the World Academy of Art and Science also. And um, I think that for the first item that I would like to highlight, it's a personal piece. Um, I think that in order for us to start thinking and creating a global network, first we need to work to create peace in our surroundings. And we need to think, do you have peace with your family? Do you have peace with your neighbors? With your team members, we cannot think in changing the world and have peace without having peace ourselves. So something that has been a great success within the pop movement creating partnership is to treat us as a family. We take care of our co-workers and let's so let's treat us as a family. I think that it's a, a great strategy that we are following. And the second um, item that I have identified is to actively listen to each other with empathy, respect, and love. We need to know how is the other feeling during this pandemic and after it, mental health will be crucial. And most of us have been facing some challenging issues that will affect us in our performance. So we need to take our, care of our partner, our coworker, friend. And sometimes people don't feel okay or they are facing that hard moment in their home. And as consequences, they could have a negative behavior with you, with us. So don't take things personally, do not make assumptions about others. And something that I have um, also learned within the pop movement is not, that nothing is right, nothing is wrong. Something um, that is really important is to listen to everyone. Let them innovate and create things different of yours. Accept and respect their ideas, inspire them, and don't let your ego control you and be open-minded. The third item that I would like to highlight is um, work with equity, inclusion, to create sustainable partnerships. If we talk about generating a global network of young people, we also have to talk about including all sectors of society because we all need everyone. We need to work in a transdisciplinary way, understanding different realities. We need to work alongside different cultures, respect their ideas, actively listen to their needs and support each other to create a sustainable partnership. Most of the times we talk about that us, the youth, are the change makers in the future. But in order for us to create a real change and, and work to protect our planet, we need experts to share their knowledge with us. We need the expertise of decision makers, and most of them are not youth. We need opportunities created by them, opportunities to participate in global decisions because they have the most of the control in the world. Equity and inclusion also means fair opportunities to everyone. Throughout my experience, I have realized that not all young people have the same opportunities. Within the pop movement, we have worked closely with most vulnerable communities, including indigenous communities. And we have worked closely with them 
and we have seen that saw that we um, there's a lot of bright young people who strive every day to stand out, but not everyone has the tools to achieve their goals. So we were creating opportunities to support all these young people to achieve their goals, creating capacities for equity and inclusion, and giving everyone the opportunity to be a leader. Another um, important point that I would like to highlight is to never lose professionalism. Professionalism is another key item. Separate work than personal situations. Always communicate with your team in a transparent way. Have a clear communication. Always work in an integrated way. Accept your reality, define your goals and success. Work on them, enjoy the process. And this will help you not to feel jealous or to feel bad um, about the other and work healthily for your dreams. So I think that let's work in a world where we are all successful. And another and, and really important point is to work with confidence and collaboration without control and protagonism. To create a global alliance, it's important to understand the meaning of collaboration, share ideas, share work, share the resources, share the credit. If we create something, everyone's name is in, otherwise anyone is in. So we need to find a common goal together. What is that common goal that we are going to work on? How is it going to benefit everyone from it? So I think that another important thing is let's have, let's leave behind the control, the bureaucracy, the protagonists. Things work better when we are thousands of successful people working together for success instead of only one successful person working for their own success. So I think that let's arm that puzzle together. I know that each of us have one important and valuable piece. So let's start putting together those pieces. But before we start, let's take a look at these five basic and important items and start a big collaboration. Great, thank you for that, Vanessa. I really liked each of the points you were talking about, especially working with inclusion and connecting with all different sectors. And it was a good reminder to put personal peace first before you can help others um, in working healthy for your dream. I love that quote. I think it should be on t-shirts. Um, I think it's really important because each of us are working for pretty huge world problems that we're trying to fix. And you know, we've seen it in our own team. I see it every day at work that there are a lot of different personalities and it's very easy to say these values and very easy to say we're confidently include everyone, don't have an ego. But when you have such a dream and such a passion for something, you have to keep these remind and even you saying it just reminded me, I really have to check myself every time I move through each of the process. It's reminding yourself to stay grounded, reminding to include everyone, don't be too bossy, don't let any people feel left out. So I think that's very important moving forward and as the leaders and everyone on this panel embodies each of these values is to continuously bring your team back to reality, continuously bring them back to the ground and make sure they're putting their, themselves first and peace in mind and everyone's enjoying this. A lot of times people in organizations, they get too stressed out and they forget that it's supposed to be fun. Changing the world is fun. Connecting with youth is fun. So I'm really happy that you just reminded us all of that and every leader that's on this panel and listening, make sure that your team is reminded of that and make sure everyone's taking a deep breath with all these heavy issues we're talking about. So I'd love to continue the panel with Gian. Um, when you did your introduction, I was blown away. I mean, you hold a lot of different positions. You have a lot of different passions from human rights to global justice to world health. I mean, I was trying to write them all down, but I just couldn't keep up. And so I'm really curious, because um, I know a lot of people on the panel and a lot of listeners, they're also involved in a lot of different organizations. And naturally, as leaders, we have this type of personality where we want to put our hand in almost everything and change the world in some capacity in different levels and different organizations. So I'd really love to hear first your opinion on how do you balance this? How do you get others to share similar passions? Because we don't want to be the only ones that are out here fighting for a change. We want the world to also get our passion and our energy. So first and foremost, I'd love for you to answer that. And then I'd like you to connect it to steps moving forward based on that and uniting all these different groups you're a part of and where you've seen it work and haven't worked. So the floor is yours. 
Wow, that was an amazing uh, question, Jody. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so basically, um, to in order for us to find our commonalities of our passion, we should start with compassion. Compassion means like we're being, we empathize with other people. We put ourselves in their shoes, but we realize we can never be in their shoes. So what can we do to bridge the gap between us, the distance between us, because everybody has their own context and their own way of living. Uh, and the diversity is a great strength for us to come together and to solve many other uh, global issues with their own complexities as well, because there is no one size fits all. So we need to have everybody being listened, but being listened is not enough, right? We had, we, that, and that's why I start with compassion. So you listen intently, actively listening um, with your peers, but also when you, list, when, when you engage with high level works or grassroots works uh, with the people, middle or class people, or even the uh, politicians, high level politicians, uh, you need to really use your compassion because in that way, you see it not only as individual struggles, but as collective struggles. I think Vanessa has mentioned it before, and I, I really agree that uh, it is about collectivism rather than individualism. And that is actually how I position myself when I have all of these organizations. I realize that I have a part there, and my part is only one of many parts there. So I do not see myself as the savior. I do not see myself as this key person to everything. So I, I always try more ways to actually not only hand over the mic, but to make that the necessity that we don't even need a mic. So then everybody can speak, everybody can have the same opportunities and progress to move forward. Um, and of course, time management, etc. Those are like life skills that we can have. But I think it's also more about um, yeah, compassion. I think it's underrated uh, in a way, uh, but I think it really is important. And I think to follow up with what we can do actually uh, to make compassion a reality, um, I think is uh, we need to actually realize the seats among us, are they filled with enough diverse people or not? Because whenever I was invited to a international uh, dialogues, uh, I think I talked with Marco from the WAAS here as well. Uh, I always check with the gender composition. Is there any female speakers on the panel? Because I realize there are too much all pa male panelists and eventually all the patriarchal norms that actually are leading to the uh, social ecological destructions. We cannot have even more men speaking as well at the same time, cis heterosexual men, let alone. Right? We need to have more diverse voices. We need to have more working class voices. We need to have more indigenous people voices. We need to have more person of colors. So maybe maybe next time I, I go to a WAAS conference, I would like to see more Asian people, more African people, um, more people from other regions so then we can have more diverse voices because once again, we do not speak over people. We do not speak over their complexities. They own the experience. They are the only ones who can talk about it. So the least thing we can do is actually to hand over the mic. And then at the end of the day, we will have a, a development, uh, a world that works for everyone, not just the few who are actually born privileged or maybe they didn't realize they privileged. So I really like you, Jody, for saying that you keep checking yourself. Uh, and that's very important as well. I'm, I'm really checking myself as well with my own privilege as a male, she's heterosexual male, even though I'm a POC, I'm an Asian. Uh, Southeast Asian person, but but still in my own country, I'm privileged. So I always try to position myself. And then when, when uh, so I think my input would be to be to have more diversity to the network that we're going to build. So then we can capture more complexities to sense the boundaries within the systems because we need systems change. But system doesn't change itself. The people change the systems. Uh, the structural change that we need. Individual behavior will never be enough. It will take like two or three life cycles of the earth to make like, okay, I leave it to yourself. It's your own right. We cannot have that. We need to use what, get, let's get back to my first point, compassion. When we see it as a collective struggle and we position our actions towards others and, and then we bring it over to a, a, a nation level. Um, and, and then when, when nations act upon themselves under this pandemic, some nations have vaccines, some nation doesn't have vaccines. And what can we do to, to, to actually further push the multilateralism so that it becomes more collectivism? 
so then more nations have more compassions, not competition, as their own driving uh, forces of change uh, uh, for for actually a better world. So maybe that's my uh, my point for now. Thank you, Jody. Great. How do you feel being the only male on this panel? Speaking of diversity. Oh well, um, it is an affirmative action, I and I approve. Awesome. That's, that's great to hear. Um, a lot of great points that you mentioned and a lot of one-liners from this panel. That's, that's why you guys were selected. Obviously, you're great speakers, but I really liked what you said, more compassion, less competition. Um, I think that was really great. And also when you mentioned knowing your part, you know, we're all in all these different organizations, but truly knowing your part, not trying to do too much in each of the organizations and overstep people. That's really great. I love, um, you know, transitioning now into Elena, where, you know, she really talked about the youth generation, how that's going to change Ukraine, and how she is initiating and trying to select people to represent um, her country and all these different organizations. So I would really like to know, um, and this will help not only World Academy but also Youth Leadership Network. How do you select? you know, youth delegates, or how, how do you go through this process of seeing who would be the best fit to represent and who would be the best leader to then ignite fires under everyone else to get inspired to make a change? And then I guess, what would you recommend our two organizations and everyone else on the panel when you're going to recruit your team and also uplift all these organizations and trying to make a name truly for your country? And I believe that's, you know, your main mission with Ukraine. Thank you, Jody, and thank you to all of the speakers uh, today. You uh, touched upon different uh, aspects of the question of how to build an uh, effective network, what should be uh, taken into account, what values, what uh, principles, etc. And this was also in my notes for today, because uh, to, to build an effective network and to build an effective program and also the youth delegates to the UN program, for example, yes, in particular, we would like to know what people we want to see, what organizations we want to choose, what uh, principles and what values they have and how we can measure their achievements and how we can see it because this is the basic thing for building the effective program an effective network and so on so uh, concerning the um, world leadership program or the world leadership network uh, it is important for us to understand uh, which types of the networks or organizations we would like to involve there uh, we would like to understand how we can uh, see the improvement of the proactive position of these organizations yes what core fields of activities do they have uh, for example uh, should they be active in science or education or environment politics diplomacy culture or we want to have all of them so uh, to start with this is a very important step basic step uh, and also these uh, principles that uh, give the fundamental thing for development uh, further. And then uh, what this network could also be helpful for these young people. It is uh, compatible with the, any program that we implement for the young people. Uh, we propose them some opportunities uh, for the development, which in turn changes the country, yes, because they develop, um, they uh, acquire new knowledge, they are active, they do these changes on the, their level, local, national, international, and thus they help the country. In our case, with the international uh, network of uh, youth organizations, it is also important to to see what this network could be helpful to these organizations. Because of course we can think of what type of network it could be, what values it should have, but what does it give to others? Why should other networks, which uh, already exist in the world, why should they be interested to join? And um, here I usually, um, 
uh, apply the combined approach, the business and scientific approach. Uh, so to, to see what uh, networks and, and organizations are already existing uh, in the world, what, which of them are successful and um, which, which of them we could, could already approach. Of course, we should think about the project management approach to the uh, building of this network and see what exact steps, what are the KPI for each step, what are the uh, deadlines and timeline, etc. So to, to see it like something very concrete and then uh, building a global network does not uh, sound any more like eating an elephant as a whole you know but you can uh, split it in some smaller parts and doing step by step uh, we can reach bigger goals i thank dina for the presentation in which she already mentioned several things and application uh, which is already something useful for these uh, networks or youth organizations that could join the global network and here I, I also would like to propose that we need to think about the uniqueness of this network. What is the unique feature it gives? What, why it is different from others? What special it is about it? And definitely special, something special is the uh, close connection to the World Academy of Art and Science and to the scientists of the world level, to the mentors uh, of and great visionaries uh, unique to the world who are by the way also interested in connecting with young people because the scientists and professionals they have their expertise they have uh, experience and profound knowledge but they lack the new trends and creativity and being fast and uh, not limited by the pre previous experience as young people uh, are. So this is a mutually beneficial connection. Uh, what is what I've noticed also with the global networks and with successful global networks is that they use communications uh, at a very high level. So they speak about what they do very transparently, very openly, very often. And it's easy to see their achievements. It's easy to find them on these new social networks like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, YouTube, uh, whatever you mentioned, the clubhouse, everybody's talking about that. Um, and it is important both for the World Academy of Arts and Science and for the youth network uh, youth global network sorry i'm always imagining new names for this, for this but the sound uh, the, the sense is the same like we should communicate and we should speak in the language clear and attractive to young people around the world this is the key for for the successful promotion and people will be attracted only by this factor so to, 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 uh, and also this builds trust to such an, an organization or network. When you see what this network does clearly every day, often, and it, and it is valuable, then young people would like to join it. Of course, uh, I think it could be important to think about the sustainability of this network uh, and think about some uh, services it could provide young people or organizations with, for example, the uh, educational courses or training or research, which is very evident from the connection with the uh, World Academy of Art and Science. So just brainstorm more about this. I'm sure you did, but this should be something important. To, it, it's not possible to, to move any project if you do not have any uh, resources and if you're not sure about the future of this project. And to, um, I don't know, maybe it is already existing that a core team, uh, a core group, both from the World Academy of Art and Science, uh, older generation, more experienced generation and younger ones should be connected. Those 
people who work on this project and they uh, get funds for that. They, it could be a grant or I don't know, it could be finances. So this is uh, something important for, the, for such big projects and important projects as this one. Because uh, volunteering is fine, but you can you you can not achieve many things by volunteer volunteering only. And yes, to to ju just two more points is uh, building collaborations. So building projects that are um, important and interesting for different parties and different groups. It could be research knowledge. Um, project uh, or idea from the youth group and finances from th some businesses or government or NGOs from around the world. And by the way, you can also provide youth organizations uh, from around the world about the instruments of youth participation because uh, different countries differ in these instru instruments. European uh, countries, for example, are usually more active uh, in different like um, youth parliament movements and things like that, that. But other countries in Africa or whatever we can take, they lack these uh, possibilities. So just to, to study the market, to, to see and research, to, to provide a research on what is happening in what countries and what unique based on that research could be given to uh, organizations that would like to be part of the network and this would give them something valuable they can get from you and they uh, by by participating in the network they will benefit and the network will benefit from them and of course uh, it's important always to involve outside consultants uh, advisors, facilitators, uh, people from outside of the box uh, to have also their expertise and a fresh view. So basically that's what I wanted to say and this is what we apply in Ukraine to building programs and to enrolling uh, new uh, people in, in our programs and building new ones. And this could be also applied to the global alliance. So like business plus uh, scientific approach gives a very, very good result. And it is something very concrete. Uh, in our case, I think that it is really needed. And working with youth is important because yes, they, uh, they uh, are Mm, like half of the population of the world is less than 25 years old. So just imagine this huge group. So these statistics makes me sure that it's important to develop youth. This is what we do in Ukraine. This, this is why we uh, try all of our programs to come to the international level. Um, because the world is global, it's very, very easy to connect. And there are all of the instruments that we can use, as Ivana said, that's not a question of how to connect globally, yes? That's a question, what for and um, who? So thank you for this discussion. I, I love to be here today. Great, thanks so much. I, I learned a lot while you were speaking. You had some clear action steps. Um, I think it was very important to first and foremost start with building metrics for any team or organization. A lot of times in nonprofits or social movements, there's a lot of the empathetic and feel good conversations and volunteer work, but if you don't put those deadlines or metrics, you can't really move the needle forward and um, get more people to join in a sustainable way. So I think that's a really great action item that we can take. I also do wanna point out, you, know, you mentioned a few times, how do you find what's unique and of course, there are many different networks around the world you can join. There's plenty of different organizations that we're all a part of, but what really will make everyone want to join the Youth Leadership Network? So I'd like to turn the conversation now. We have about 25 minutes. Um, just, I would like two bullets from each speaker. So let's try to keep it under two minutes each. Just about 
um, two specific recommendations that you see the youth leadership network being that unique network that you would engage in or something you'd like us to implement so we can help your organization. So I'd love to, um, I'll start with Vanessa, I'm looking at my screen here. So I'll go Vanessa, Gian, um, Ivana, and then Elena, if you'd like to touch again, but I know you had some fantastic bullet points already outlined. So, um, and then we'll end with Dina and I know we got the video working now. So we'll um, see that and then we'll open for Q and A to the audience. So again, just two points about what are two clear steps that YLN can help your organization or you'd like to see as we're moving forward and building this. So Vanessa, please. Thank you so much, Jody. So um, two important uh, points to know uh, how we, you can help uh, the, the organization. It's, um, I think that something important is to mobilize um, right now social media. Um, right now that we are in quarantine, I know that everybody's talking about social media. So I think that something that will be really helpful is to, if we unite together and we create a social media campaign, it will be like an excellent, um, an excellent push to, to start um, adding more people and start creating more organizations that also are working in the same goal. So I think that's um, one important point that we can start. Um, we can start right now sharing our social media on the chat, <laughs> everybody, and we can start being connected and um, create something else after this great panel that we are having. Um, and another, uh, another point that I think that um, will be really helpful that we can start creating something together, um, it would be that um, additional to the social media strategy, uh, we could we can have a educational campaign. I think that um, right now um, education is uh, we have a lot of, of lack of education in the world in so diversity um, subjects. Right now, um, the health subject um, we have a lot of people that um, they they have lack of education and also in climate change that that's the the, the mainly subject that we work on. So I think that um, additional to this big social media campaign that we can work together on, we can create this education campaign in, inside the, the social media campaign. So um, right now it's like really, really popular to have influencers and um, people that can um, attract more people in social media. So maybe we can start creating influencers, but in a good way, influencers that educate, influencers that give uh, opportunities to, to young people. So um, I think that Great. these are like the two main things. Perfect. Thanks so much, Judy. Thanks so much for that. Um, Gian, let's turn over to you. What are your two recommendations for while on that, how we can help you? Yes, uh, I think the first point would be resources. I think it's been mentioned before. Uh, many young people actually have stages to perform in a way. They have channels, they have network, but they have lack of resources, serious lack of resources. And when they have resources, usually it's very donor driven in a way, very market based solution that they are expecting. So eventually the young people have no control over the project they are proposing in the first place. It becomes a zombie. It become like just another job, uh, you know. So basically, there's no meaningful youth participation in that. So actually, resources that is actually allows them also enough freedom uh, to liberty to actually exercise their own um, um, solutions as well according to their own complexities and make it more localized. So resources and localized. And it brings me to my second point, which is representation, diverse representation, more, more um, you know, proactive approach to actually engage more young people in other regions, Africa, Asia, Eurasia, um, all of other regions, uh, Pacific. Um, so I, I see Pacific, I think we need to engage more diverse young people and diverse voices as well, because the, the problems that we're facing right now is actually becoming more complex and more interconnected in a way. Uh, it is, has been proven by this pandemic. So I think uh, the, the only way forward is actually to be more, um, 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 actually to be more diverse uh, gender wise and race wise and, and many uh, region wise. I think we need to be more uh, proactive in that. So I think that will be uh, two of my, uh, my, uh, my, my, my inputs, Jody. Great, thanks so much, Jan. Um, Ivana, I'd love to hear your thoughts on two recommendations. Thank you. Uh, well, the, the first recommendation would be to try to use the bottom-up approach of solution uh, 
problem solving strategy in order to uh, understand the real needs of people and youth and to avoid being an alienated network of, um, of leaders. Uh, so this can be by aligning with the existing co-working uh, labs and, uh, and, and NGOs that work uh, in, the, in the different countries. And uh, se my second advice would be, because I think also it is very, uh, it is the 20, it's the 21st uh, uh, century approach towards uh, NGOs and uh, civil society engagement also. Uh, so my second uh, proposal would be to uh, be uh, very loud and clear about uh, the principles of the Youth Leadership Network and to have really on the, on the front page uh, of the Youth Leadership ne Network uh, clear principles that everything uh, we do that we want to do has to be 100% aligned with the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, for example, and so on and so forth. So. Um, I also have proposed earlier, uh, but it was not uh, so successful, the, my proposal yet, <laughs> but uh, advocating for the, the change of the notion of security throughout the movement called security for me. Uh, for example, to change the idea, um, the idea for me, I, I don't feel safe if I have the, um, I don't know, great uh, military potential of the country, but rather if I have the clear water to drink and so on and so forth. So these are just some of the thoughts to, to think about. And yeah, thank you. Great. Um, Elena, do you have any additional points, two points you'd like to make? And then um, I'm going to let Dina introduce our video and then we'll take open Q&A. Um, actually, I've mentioned everything at the beginning and now uh, everyone added to, uh, to what is important. Uh, my steps are the same, like identify first the needs of these youth organizations and uh, youth leaders, what are their pains, what they want to, to solve, what, and then form the portfolio of our uh, proposal. So the notion of our uniqueness, the notion of what they get from this uh, cooperation and from this network and what they can uh, give to it. That's, that's it. And I just loved when Vanessa said about the influencers. I remember it about my flu and was co coughing all of the time. But it's great to have this opportunity uh, of being online and so connected from different countries from around the world, so whenever you are in whatever state you are, it's, it's great. So we are already a global network. So this, this network is already global, if it has such people as they are in this panel. Great. Thank you. Dina, would you like to say a few words before the support team from WASP will share our video? You're muted. <laughs> I would just like to say that our platform is envisioned as a place where we will connect together and where we will unite to transform current leadership uh, and transform it into the united leadership, uh, more exclusive leadership. And uh, now we will see from the video because, as I said, discussions will be open, uh, will be reliable and uh, directly connected with decision makers. That's how we envision it. So I think. It will be. Great. It will cover everything that you uh, pointed out, and also okay. Vanessa, uh, I agree with your social media campaign. We can speak about it and also promote this platform because this is not violent platform. It's the worldwide platform. It's platform for all of us. Okay. All right. Now, uh, can I please ask uh, admins to share a video? <laughs>
Great. So that is the beginning of our teaser video. We have a lot more work to be done, um, but with your help and recommendations, I know we'll be able to get there. Unfortunately, we are out of time. The next session is going to start a little bit earlier. So I want to thank everyone for taking my questions, answering so clear and precisely. And I'd love for everyone to share their contact info with the audience members, start connecting online and sharing each other's movements. And I hope to see you guys all soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So good afternoon, good morning. Um, thank you very much again for joining us. So we'll be uh, starting the session very shortly. Uh, perhaps for um, worst staff, administration, Vani, um, we would like to share um, some slides. Uh, both Professor Fiorini and I will have slides at the beginning and the end. I also prepared introductory slides. Can you hear me, Vani? Yes, sir, I hear you. You can okay, share. Okay, thank sense. you very much. Uh, so um, the, <clears throat> I also have slides to introduce all speakers when they will be shortly before they will speak. So uh, would that be possible to switch between them? Yes, you can do it. Everyone has an option okay. to share. Okay, uh, let, let me, let me uh, try. This is the, those are the slides that will be shown throughout. Um, and maybe you could put them then into... Um, can you see any slides from my side yet? Oh, not yet. Uh, can you click on the green arrow at the bottom of the panel? Yes, I will share, select. Um, can you see now? Yes. Okay. And I'll be switching also from full screen to um, removing myself. And the other slides will be for me later. Can you see this uh, evolving, towards evolving? I don't see any transition now. Okay, so I will probably will have to select them again. You probably will be able to see it now. Now, now I see it. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Can you see now the planetary moment, the introductory slides? No, sir. I see only the second slide now. Okay, so then I will switch back. So well, we will have to switch between them. Can you see now the planetary moment? Yes, I see it, but it's now smaller screen. Can you maximize the window? Yes. Okay, thanks. It's good now. Okay. Good afternoon, Carlos. Um, Sorry, I, I, was, I, was, I was on I was on mute. Hello, Vital, then everybody. Yes, good How to are see you? you. Yeah, uh, the same. I'm, the same okay. on my side. 
very uh, pleased. Professor Segarstrale, uh, again, welcome. I, I remember you from uh, Milano uh, yes, last I year. <laughs> <laughs> and also we have, uh, we don't have everybody yet. Uh, so we'll wait a few minutes um, and, uh, or we could at least start, but it will start without the whole complete set of individuals we might run into troubles. Um, I will not say hello again to R Rudolfo uh, because we just talked uh, <laughs> a few <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> and we, <clears throat> we but told. again, welcome, welcome everybody. I, I just received a message from Piero Dominici that uh, he might have uh, problems to join us. Oh boy. Um, is there any possibility? Is it power? He lost power yesterday. Yeah, it's, it's the same, the same today. Uh, could you suggest to him that perhaps he could uh, connect at least through uh, his telephone? Uh, I think that um, Ross has the ability to connect. Okay, I try. Uh, do you know? Uh, any, do you know whether Antonio uh, Presser Freitas will be joining us? No, I, I received only the, this communication from Piero. Okay. Uh, Yvonne, uh, I, I, think, I think you joined us, right? Welcome. Um, Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, we told. Uh, Good to see you all. Great to see you. Um, we still have, um, so Piero, we know that he might not be joining. Um, Antonio might be sitting somewhere else, but um, perhaps within a minute or so, uh, with your permission and, and uh, Rudolfo, we, we probably should start regardless, rather than waiting for individuals, not knowing whether they will be joining us. I think that the, this team um, with Carlos, Carlos uh, hopefully is coming back. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to, to do a lot of, uh, 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 we, we can really take the rest of the day talking about this topic. Mm -hmm. We won't. Uh, uh, however, um, I think that everybody knows that our session has been extended in time uh, to two hours, from one and a half hour to two hours. Uh, so we won't have to rush. Uh, I think um, uh, the pressure should be somewhat reduced, uh, <laughs> not increased, and it should be okay. So when Carlos, oh, um, uh, Carlos, I was saying that the, uh, our session has been extended to two hours. Um, and hopefully Antonio will be able to join us and perhaps we could get uh, some help from uh, was administration to contact the individuals and even suggest the solutions so that we could really roll and then uh, whoever will join us. I understand that Gary will be joining us and others will be joining us too. Just um, the consider it is actually one hour and 30 minutes, not two hours. Uh, one hour and 30 minutes? Yes. Okay, okay. So, so that's, that's, that's good. So exactly as it was. Yeah. All right. So what, do I, what I, uh, uh, Rudolfo, maybe you could, you could introduce. So the okay. planetary moment, as, as, you, as you can see on the screen, if you can see it, um, is something that is extremely important and uh, Rudolfo will introduce it. I will advance the slides for him, the initial slides. Oh, I, I, have, I have mine, Widow. Okay, have... very good. Yes, yeah. go ahead then. You. If, you, if you let me share my screen. Okay. I stop sharing. Okay, thank you so much.
Ok. Ok, is this full screen now? Yes. Perfect. So I, I just uh, like to give you this, this little presentation just to set the tone of the full session. Um, and, and so I, I take, I, I'll take uh, these this three topics, that is some information, the two perspectives, uh, our fundamental choices and conclusion. Uh, ethics of in, and information, uh, you know that uh, human being has changed information uh, by representations. And uh, uh, big data is just one type of those representations. And so, but when we have big data, how can we recall the information associated with them in a, in a reliable way? Well, uh, usually this is done by data interpretation and analysis tools, but if we want to be ready for a, a new starting, a new re a renaissance, we need a new hermeneutics. New hermeneutics that uh, uh, is able to overcome the limitation of the usual hermene hermeneutics that is based on, on, uh, on this Carter's error. And so it's time to amend the Descartes error, considering non-duality of mind and matter. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we, ha we have to consider non-duality or word of appearance, formal approach, and word of substance, substantial approach. More non-duality of formal approach, abstract concepts, and substantial approach, operational concepts concepts. And finally, non-duality of ethics and aesthetics. How, how can we achieve this result? Well, you know, we, we were educated uh, under the continuum hypothesis assumption, and that is the usual outer universe of abstract concepts. But we have even an inner universe operational concept, concept that uh, they are really related to discrete hypothesis assumption. And so we have, uh, we usually have two perspective understanding. The red one, that is the linear one, the continuum one, the usual one we were educated from. And the new one, the yellow one, that is uh, uh, exponential thinking. So we have the red line that is a, a linear thinking. And then we have the yellow line that is exponential thinking. They are complementary. We cannot uh, do anything without them or just with only one of them. Because if we use only one of them, we, uh, we are just uh, on, the, uh, on, the right, on the side to make a lot of mistakes. They are coupled together. And in fact, if we recall the red line, the linear thinking, the linear thinking, the usual one we were educated from, focused on di direct space only. And uh, uh, with uh, our new hermeneutics, uh, we realized that direct space is only one component of a, a more uh, complex uh, information space. We have a, a, a more three components, called direct space, reciprocal space and reciprocal co-space. In the past, we completely ignored them. And the current situation is just the result of that. Uh, and uh, the, the point is that uh, ignoring those components, we ignored even their relationships. And so our information was really reduced to a minimum to take decisions with a lot of uncertainty. Furthermore, this, this framework allows us to put into, into direct uh, relationship the outer universe, the usual one, the direct space with the core direct space, with the, the inner universe, the reciprocal space with the reciprocal core space. And so we have a, a solid framework to put in relationship inner models of our mind with outer relations, uh, outer uh, 
uh, a, rea a realization of the direct space in a ro robust way. And so we are ready to leap from quanta to qualia. And uh, it's, uh, it's just up to us to, cho to choose the parameters that we want uh, our system uh, work, work uh, on. Uh, and so uh, you know that uh, asymptotic choices are only four. And it's up to us to choose the one we like most. <laughs> And so according to this background, with, then we have to find a, a, an answer or many answers, many good answers to this question. What is the best strategy to stress and invest more on information ethics? And then you, say, you find here the, the question that you already saw on the, on the program. The most important question when considering science, engineering and technology are, what do we want to do with them? Why do we want to do with a specific kind of technology? How can we do this in a manner that enriches our life? Our lives, and that, that's, a, and that's a key point. We need the collaborative innovation, collective intelligence to overcome personal limitation towards com common well-being. But uh, we have to recall always that the, the worst enemy we have to face is ourselves <laughs> thank you for your attention thank you very much uh, for that setting up of the stage uh, Rodolfo um, I think that we could really now open up um, the uh, floor for a discussion and I will provide also a few slides at the end of our talk uh, talks and the discussion. So <clears throat> you can see now that we have uh, Piero Dominici will not be here. Here is Antonio. Uh, has Antonio arrived yet? If not, we would really count, uh, we would add a little more time for all of us. Since we have one and a half hours, we will have around ten minutes uh, for each person. We could split this into. Five, five, two rounds of talks. So thank you very much. If uh, I could now switch to my slides. So as, um, as Rudolfo already brought this fundamental question and you have seen in the write-up, introductory write-up, this uh, question has many, many possible takes, many possible uh, approaches. Um, Rudolfo presented uh, the approach that would have to be a preamble to, to, this, to the strategic changes in our thinking in our approaches to modeling, in our approaches even to uh, the analytics of the big data and um, making sense of the big data in, in the context of living, being. So <clears throat> we would really have different uh, views, different presentations today coming from different perspective and backgrounds and um, the issue over here is still uh, quite important. And as long as we probably will be walking on this planet will be important, but it will change on us. But as of today, the fear of, uh, and many of the strategic decisions around the globe, um, the fear of the weapons uh, that we knew or we, were uh, trained to know um, is probably still here, but there are other additional elements that we should really consider very seriously. Uh, as you have seen in Texas, um, 
disabling of a power grid uh, will do us in. If I live in a, an area that uh, last week we had minus 60 and went minus 60 degrees centigrade in the wind chill. Uh, if we lose power, we won't survive for even three days and nobody else will know about it even. So this is, a, is an issue that is driving all my activities to help preventing that from happening. Not for us, but for our children. We also have experienced that another danger exists that in view of the big data and many other things that we will address today, mis disinformation is not discernible anymore. That tremendous ability to communicate and interact um, also brings that as a result of it. These are two elements only of many others. And Rodolfo and I will try to help in that uh, navigate through this, through this process and uh, uh, help in the, in, the, in the process of discussing those issues and finding possible ways of solving. And still the core idea is how um, the World Academy of Art and Science could play a vital role in um, not resolving the problem, but helping in our transformation as humans to address those problems globally in the form that Rudolfo alluded to. So it's a great privilege for us to uh, have one of the speakers today, um, uh, Ulika uh, Segestrale, who is a professor at Illinois Institute of Technology. And I brought to you some of her activities. She has many others, but one of them is the Defenders of the Truth, and another is Nature's Oracle. Um, Ulika, would you be kind enough to uh, share your views with us on this important issue of ethics and global security? Yes. Um, hello. Should I do something? Yes, I, I just... I, we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, I will well, stop I... sharing. Yes, I am not going to uh, have any slides. I'm going to speak. Uh, and yes. uh, I want to say how pleased I am to be in this session because I have had uh, very nice conversations with both Vittel and with uh, Rodolfo, <laughs> uh, both in Milan and, and, and at other conferences. Uh, and uh, 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 it's a real pleasure to be in this session because it uh, responds to a kind of metaphysical quest that I have uh, myself, but I am not able to uh, execute it in any other fields that I uh, am in myself, but I, I am thrilled to be together with people who think this way, because I think it is very much, there is very much uh, uh, essence to this kind of thinking. Uh, it's hard to grab it, and I hope that we will hear more from Rodolfo. This sounded very mystical, what you said, but it was extremely exciting. Uh, so uh, uh, I want to, uh, I actually was uh, 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 stimulated, but also a little baffled by this long title because it said uh, ethics and information. And that, I said, yes, I can deal with that. And then it went into uh, global security and said, I cannot deal with that. So I, I will take the first part and say what I, how I see ethics, uh, information and ethics, how one can think about that. Because for sure, whatever uh, global aims we have and ultimate aims to do something with really complicated models and uh, combination of inner and uh, external uh, uh, modeling or whatever, which is, sounds very interesting. Um, I, I can go back, I think we have to go back to something rather basic, which is that, uh, yes, we all measure the disinformation and that is really terrible and it is not perceivable, which is really terrible. But I wanted to go back to kind of something even more basic, hoping that it's still relevant in this 
very uh, fastly uh, uh, moving world and we don't really know where it's going. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the importance of having facts that actually are uh, reliable. Okay, so I will start for, from, a, I'm a sociologist of science and I am getting increasingly thrilled and also some, somewhat irritated by the system of science. I think it has fundamental flaws, but it's hard to repair them. Uh, 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 so I want, so I will uh, approach this um, issue uh, of information and ethics. I'm sorry, I have a thing that comes up here. I can't stop it. This tyranny of, uh, uh, of media. Where am I now? What happened? Uh, uh, okay. We can uh, see you. Everything is okay from our end. You can see me, but I can't see you, but that doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Something happened. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I will speak. Uh, my background uh, is both in uh, natural science and in social science. I actually have a master in organic chemistry. I first thought I would go into that kind of world of biochemistry and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and such things because it looked as if it was so extremely exciting. But I realized that I was not really a, a laboratory. Uh, laboratory person. Instead, I was starting getting more interested in how scientists think. And that is where I am, where part of my interests are today. Uh, but another thing I have been uh, wondering about all my life, and that's why I'm close to, to Rodolfo in this uh, uh, kind of quest, is the connection between uh, uh, subjective feeling and subjective certainty, may maybe, and uh, objective uh, reality, and objective, uh, objectively provable uh, uh, things which of course is supposedly like a de one definition of science. Uh, but meanwhile, there is so much going on in scientists' minds. So my, the two books that you showed, uh, uh, one is called Defenders of the Truth. That is a, a slightly ironical title, but nobody has seen it that way. People believe that I'm telling the truth to them, which is very interesting. It's a social psychological fact that you look at the book the way you want. Uh, anyway, it is about the controversy which involved uh, feuding scientists uh, about something like human nature and also the, the way to study human nature. And uh, uh, they ended up uh, 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 calling each other names and accusing each other of bad science or the wrong scientific attitude. Um, uh, and uh, analyzing this so-called sociobiology controversy, which was also connected to the so-called IQ controversy which had been going on before. This happened at the, in the second part of the last century, okay? And finished, I think, uh, around 2000 or in the 90s. I mean, it, this kind of was a slowly moving uh, uh, thing. Uh, these, these, these controversies actually was an, a symptom of an unresolved problem, problem in science, which is that, uh, uh, there is a lot of assumptions about what good science is and assumption that people are doing good science, but not enough uh, checks, uh, checks uh, for this to be true. And one thing that is really left out of science and which I think this, uh, this uh, uh, conference has been wonderfully uh, bringing up in several sessions or a couple of sessions at least that I have attended already uh, is the need for scientists to consider the consequences of scientific theories, of the theories or the, or the, or the, or the data that, uh, or the conclusions that they are uh, producing. Uh, and this of course is not part of science proper and has not been, maybe for good reasons. Uh, and I refer back to, to uh, the famous uh, charter of the Royal Society uh, where the uh, scientists uh, promised the king that the society would not be meddling with politics and, uh, uh, and morals and such things. Uh, and of course, what they actually wanted to say that they will not conspire to uh, uh, ri rise up in revolution uh, uh, once more. Uh, but this seems to be uh, the way scientific societies operate. Uh, everybody follows a certain kind of standard, but uh, uh, well, societies maybe is a place and I think Thus, is an unusual place where this can happen. But uh, so actually, I'm maybe wrong about this. 
who knows what they said in those societies. We, we don't have records of their discussions necessarily. But uh, science as such, the scientific discourse, proper scientific discourse as such, does not involve ethical considerations. But of course, so many scientists don't, don't agree about this. And we have the atomic scientists, we have the doomsday clock, we have the Asilomar conference to, uh, when biotech uh, in the 1970s started, uh, there was great worry about the security, the safety of those labs. A, a new uh, engineered E. coli may just uh, let loose and uh, invade our guts and who knows what would happen. Uh, and so, so there was a, a, a moratorium indeed agreed upon by scientists. So there has been responsibility in kind of emergency situations, uh, I would say. Uh, what happened in, in, in the controversy that I am referring to and my book, Defenders of the Truth, uh, uh, is an analysis of both uh, empirical analysis because I interviewed both sides and then I interviewed lots of other commentators and then I followed up the controversy till about 2000. So I have a, a I did a, like, a, how should I say, a philosophical analysis of what the whole thing was about. Uh, and part of the problem is exactly this, this, this uh, lack of a forum, legitimate forum in science to discuss these issues. And I, uh, uh, I think that maybe we have to have a new ethical uh, component introduced into the uh, ex, uh, presumed uh, uh, norms of science or expected scientific behavior, uh, which could, would be legitimate. And this would be news because the fact that this kind of uh, 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 discussion, this ethical discourse was not legitimate part of science at the time made, uh, uh, made uh, both parties in the controversy accuse each other of both bad science and uh, uh, somehow bad intentions. Uh, one side was calling the other Marxists, the other one was calling uh, the same side uh, 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 deluded capitalist or something like this, um, or people who want to defend the status quo. I mean, it became rather simplistic political uh, interchange there. Uh, uh, and, and also a, a somewhat uh, embarrassing, I think, assumption that bad science goes together with bad political stance. I would say uh, that is a bad assumption because <laughs> the worst, it would be even worse if good science went, to, went together with a bad uh, uh, political uh, ambition. Okay, so that is the connection between, uh, uh, so that is my, my take. Uh, 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 that's fact, in, uh, first point is that facts need to be reliable. I will just get to that point. And then that ethics need to be included in science in a much stronger way. And I think we are ready for that uh, by now. Uh, okay. Uh, and I would say that together, the import, this issue about facts or which we can call information and ethics, which we can, which is ethics, uh, can also be ethics of science, are the two components that I see uh, uh, embedded in this uh, uh, idea of nose, or the noosphere or the infosphere uh, from, uh, let's say, the Tel Hardian point of view, uh, uh, which where the noosphere is, uh, is, is a higher stage than the bios biosphere and where, which is a, a, fair, a sphere of the intellect, but it also has a moral dimension because it wants us to act uh, in, in a way to be kind of stewards of the planet. So it has a caretaking and also other kinds of moral implications. It's a beautiful vision, uh, 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 which maybe many of us feel, but it is not um, um, implemented very clearly in any kind of scientific vision, except I would say in maybe E.O. Wilson, uh, the uh, professor, uh, emeritus professor from Harvard, who started this whole sociobiology controversy. So I know him so well and have analyzed him <laughs> so well, so much. Uh, but one of his, uh, uh, because he is uh, a person who is mostly concerned about the whole planet and not about humans at all, which was a mistake of the, his terrible critics at the time. Uh, 
he he has this idea also of uh, I believe of humans as caretakers of the planet, and uh, we should not believe that we are uh, we can dominate it. Uh, uh, so I think he come. I think he is Kevin Hart inspired at least. Um, so so uh, so when I saw this about noosphere, I said I kind of know something about it, and I know some scientists with this ambition. There are many such people uh, 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 who want to to serve, to conserve the planet, of course, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and one maybe can take it even uh, uh, one step uh, further, which is human human's duty, uh, and the plan for humans is to actually do that. Okay. Uh, now, how many we told how many how many minutes have I spoken already? <coughs> uh around 10 that's okay we uh, okay. as you know we have we have uh, people who have not shown up um and oh. probably by this time they will will not so you you still have a few minutes okay i i will kind of reserve uh, another part of my uh, of su suggested uh, interpretations for later perhaps okay. do we get we get another chance i guess again yes yes we will okay great so yes so uh uh so I think that what we have learned from this kind of very intense uh, controversies that have happened uh, about uh, human nature or anything that has to do with uh, 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 information that has implications for humans in some way, uh, it shows that this is important. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Actually, what this uh, what was the, what the critics of these kinds of fields that study human nature from a biological point of view, not exactly genetics, but all kinds of uh, biological descriptions, which they call genetic determinism. It was not really ge genetic determinism, but it would easily lead to it. I think they were very right in in the in the in, in their perception that uh, uh, um, you know, kind of. Uh, too much talk about humans being such and such uh, could be interpreted by the general public as uh, scientists' uh, uh, strong conclusion about this. And, and then that would be taken a step further and be given kind of uh, uh, moral, in, uh, moral in, uh, uh, interpretations so that, and which would affect our treatment of other, uh, other humans maybe reinforce our maybe inbuilt uh, xenophobia or whatever we have inbuilt in us, uh, you know, by evolution, we have to fight many things, but it would have given like more uh, uh, support to those kinds of things, maybe sexism, racism, all kinds of things. And that is why uh, certain facts, which are, even if they are perceived to be true at the time, and facts, the content of facts changes over time, even if they are perceived that to be true, can be very dangerous and inflammatory because of people's maybe belief. And I think I came to this conclusion by looking at this. Uh, people really have a have a tendency of believing that uh, uh, there are uh, that there are uh, clear implications for human behavior of some kind of scientific statements. And I even have a, my favorite uh, uh, my favorite quote from. Uh, one of the critics, uh, a professor at a good university, who actually uh, seems to have believed very strongly in this and taken it absolutely for granted. So uh, we talked about uh, uh, sexism and he says, Wilson is very sexist because he has uh, uh, talked about differences between men and women and they are this way and that way. Uh, Okay, if you look in the book called On Human Nature, you see that it's not only what men and women do, but it is a description of societies. And then he says, well, what should we do in, what should we do with this knowledge? Well, we can do three, three things. We can either go, go with it, we can contradict it, or we can uh, uh, exaggerate it. Uh, uh, we can, we can uh, do whatever. It is up to us to decide, meaning us, this is society. But that was not mentioned. Uh, so it became very uh, inflammatory. And then the same person or person belonging to the same group who argued this way uh, said, uh, uh, was talking about racism uh, and, and, and saying, uh, I said, 
Okay, so tell me then, what would you say if there was a fact, some fa strong fact about racial differences? Okay, I believe provoked him. So he said, well, I don't think there are any facts like that, but if there were facts, you know, then I would become a racist. And this deeply shocked me. So even scientists, among scientists, there are people who believe that facts have uh, implications. And therefore you have to fight anybody who goes around with facts uh, or presents facts that are dangerous. I think it is, is intuitively kind of understandable that this is true, but you cannot be so violent about it. You instead, one has to find some way of, of uh, handling this because facts do have consequences probably in people's minds. Okay, so this was uh, about uh, 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 this was about uh, information and ethics. I think the, in, it, in the strongest way I know they may be connected. Uh, the other thing was did I did not expand on was that facts have to be reliable uh, in general for to be uh, at least. Uh, to be any help or any uh, material to even refer to if you want to make uh, various kinds of policy decisions or, 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 or whatever. And the problem today is that uh, facts may be, become rather fraudulent. <laughs> we have, a, 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 an, I think we have an increase in fraud in science and it's very hard to detect because the scientific control systems that exist, of course, science is a very smart uh, system and tries to uh, eliminate uh, individual follies and mistakes. That's why we have peer review. That's we have why we have hypothetical replication, but in please nobody goes around replicating because it takes so much time and you need to do your own research. So these uh, control systems are not very functional always. Uh, and, uh, and, and that means that uh, uh, determined fraud, fraudulent uh, uh, people can actually get, uh, get away with, with things. Even if now the whole system, uh, the whole system is rather alerted to this, there is something called a, uh, a retraction watch. There is a website where you have papers that are retracted, and why are they retracted? It turns out in many many cases that it is because there was something fraudulent there, not only error. Uh, and why are people uh, uh, doing these things? Why are scientists, uh, uh, younger scientists particularly, doing this? Well, because there is enormous pressure. You need to, to have papers, etc. And other phenomenon that is very bad for the reliability of facts, maybe even worse, because it may be much more common, is the idea of uh, uh, p, uh, p hacking, which is uh, uh, selecting the kind of results from a, ma a mass of results that you have gotten that show uh, uh, show. Uh, 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 shows significance. Okay. Uh, okay. So perhaps, yeah. uh, perhaps we could uh, we could really move uh, to another uh, speaker, and then yes. we'll come back on a second round if yes. it will be so, able to. Do. Okay. Yes. Thank so you this very is much. The first part. Yes. Yes. Okay. I need to see everybody. Where are you now? So if you could uh, allow me to, to share screen. Um, okay, thank you. So what, what we will do, um, we will move now to uh, the other speakers, uh, but as you um, know, we don't have uh, Piero, uh, but Piero, I was looking to, to hear from Piero. Piero apparently lost power again. Uh, that happened to him yesterday and the day before. Uh, but Piero has been involved in uh, human complex systems and has been publishing, producing lots of outcome uh, in various aspects of it. So complexity of um, interactions between humans and within humans, I think, played a big role. And I would address, uh, refer to you to some of his publications um, he published in various journals uh, so it is available very freely 
please follow his, hopefully he will join us if he would be able to. But Piero would have really uh, uh, provided that perspective that um, Rudolfo all already uh, has alluded to. Uh, we are also looking forward to hearing from Antonio uh, the Arujo uh, Freitas, who has a lot of experience. I listened to him on various occasions, and there are many, many interesting ideas of how to address uh, the idea of extraction uh, of information that is reliable um, from the massive data that we have and how to deal and how to transport it to, to others. Um, do we have Antonio among us? No. And the third person that I was looking also forward to is um, uh, Michael Marian, who has uh, produced recently the Security and Sustainability Guide. It is also freely available. I would strongly suggest that you look into it. There are many angles that we would want to address. How information ethics um, could play a big role in resolving the issues of not only security and sustainability, but our existence. So this is, we, we thought this would really provide a good view on the background. But it is a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Ibon, who has been also very, very active at different levels and specifically in the Millennium Project. The Millennium Project addresses many fundamental issues also that are of, of great importance to the interest of the World Academy of Arts, uh, Arts and Science. Uh, so I would like to ask Ibon to um, provide his view and perhaps we could really follow, uh, follow the idea of say seven to 10 minutes max. We would come back to, uh, to the discussion later, but we would like to see also hear from um, uh, Carlos and uh, all of those who want to, who want to talk. Um, Yvonne? So uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um... So yes. um, first of all, I, I would like to uh, thank the World Academy and uh, congratulate, uh, thank for thank uh, the World Academy for inviting me, and and the Millennium Project again. Some of our uh, fellows are are already have been participating in different sessions and uh, together with with our um, CEO uh, Jerome Glenn. And uh, also congratulate the World Academy for this uh, anniversary, uh, which is a great news for uh, for the global leadership. So let me let me go to the to the point by um, uh, addressing one of the challenges that we are uh, working on uh, in our research at the at the Millennium Project. Uh, we we are uh, researching on um, the main 15 challenges uh, that we uh, have uh, agreed as, as the world uh, agenda for, for today and for the future uh, for humanity. And uh, the topic of today's session uh, directly relates to uh, Global Challenge 15, uh, where, when uh, we ask how can ethical considerations become more routinely incorporated into global decisions? So our analysis is the following. Um, increasingly, uh, decisions are being made by artificial intelligence. Since their algorithms are, are not ethically neutral, uh, the future of ethics will in part be influenced by auditing ethical assumptions in software. It will also be influenced by the flood of new information channels that are uh, used to uh, pollute and distort perceptions, uh, leading many to uh, rethink how to know the truth of global developments. Information warfare has been waged against national elections. Uh, political spin masters uh, down, drowned out the pursuit of truth uh, so uh, we need to learn to prevent our counter information uh, warfare and fake news. At the same time, an increasingly educated and internet connected generation is increasingly racing against the abuse of power and demanding accountability. 
the release of the Panama Papers in April 2016 exposed corruption worldwide, uh, surveillance implications of the Internet of Things connected with artificial intelligence could deter unethical decision making. New technologies also make it easier for more people to do more good at a faster pace uh, than ever before. The rising number of protests around the world uh, shows a growing unwillingness to tolerate unethical uh, decision making by power elites. Also, although uh, short term economic me first attitudes are prevalent throughout the world, uh, love for humanity, solidarity and global consciousness are also evident in the norms expressed in the many transnational uh, political movements, interreligious dialogues, UN organizations, international philanthropy, the Olympic spirit, refugee relief, development programs for poor nations, NGOs like Doctors Without Borders, and international journalists. Global ethics are emerging around the world uh, through the evolution of ISO standards and international treaties that are defining the norms of civilization. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights continues to shape discussions about global ethics and justice and to influence uh, decisions across ethical, religious, and ideological div divides. The International Criminal Court, Court has indicted over 40 leaders and the World Court has delivered 126 uh, judgments between nation and state. Corporate social responsibility programs, ethical marketing and social investing are increasing. The UN Compact is reinforcing ethics in business decision making. However, um, corporate behavior can be less ethical in lower income countries. For example, waste disposal and cigarettes advertising, corporate advanced marketing methods that bypass consumers' deliberate capacities based on cognitive and behavioral science, sciences raise new questions of ethics. Transparency International's 2016 Corruption Perceptions Index shows the deterioration over the past several years. It found that over two thirds of the 176 countries and territories assess a score below 50 on a scale from zero highly corrupt to 100 very clean. The Global Slavery Index estimates that 45.8 million people were in some form of modern slavery in 2016 in 167 countries assessed and that 58 are 58 sorry uh, percent are in five countries India China Pakistan Bangladesh and Uzbekistan as a percent of population however the highest numbers are found in North Korea Uzbekistan Cambodia India and Qatar press freedom has been decreasing over the decade and the global concentration of wealth has become obscene the poly prolif proliferation of unethical decisions that led by the 2008 financial crisis and 2009 global recession clearly demonstrate uh, the interdependence of economic results and ethics. The moral will to act in collaboration across national, institutional, political, religious and ideological boundaries that is necessary to address today's global challenges requires global ethics. Public morality based on religious metaphysics is challenged daily by growing secularism, uh, leaving many unsure about the moral basis for decision making. Many turn back to old traditions for guidance, giving rise to fundamentalist movements in many religions today. Unfortunately, religion and ideologies that claim moral uh, superiority give rise to the we day splits that, that are being played out in conflicts around the world. Mm -hmm. The acceleration of scientific and technological change seems to be beyond conventional means of ethical evaluation. 
is it ethical to clone ourselves or bring dinosaurs back to life or to invent thousands of new life forms throughout synthetic biology? Since there is little time to assess daily science and technology advances, is it time to invent anticipatory ethical systems? Mm. Just as law has a body of uh, previous judgments to draw on uh, for guidance, will we also need bodies of ethical judgments about possible future events? For example, in the foreseeable future, it may be possible uh, for individuals acting alone to make and deploy weapons of mass destruction. To, to prevent this possibility, will governments sacrifice citizens' privacy? Will families and, com and communities be more effective in nurturing uh, more uh, mentally healthy moral people? Will public health and education systems create early detection and intervention strategies? The consequences of the failure to raise moral, mentally healthy people will be more serious in the future than in the past. Technologies accessible to individuals, organizations, and governments have become too powerful and diverse to allow the growth of unethical behavior. So this is my starting point. Uh, then in the second round, I will come to some of the actions and uh, strategies we are proposing from the Millennium Project. And I hope we can discuss a little bit more on this. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. I really, we really appreciate your perspective and your activities throughout. Um, the, I have to apologize prof profusely. Uh, I missed Michael. Michael, I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> Just I, I assumed that you would not, that was wrong assumption. You always come. So um, the, the floor is yours. So I, I'm again, very, very sorry. I introduced you. I introduced your things. Could you unmute yourself? Um, and um, I hope that you will accept it. And again, present your view that is so needed in this discussion. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Rayton. Uh I was just invited to this panel last week by uh, Gary, Gary Jacobs thought I should be on it because I have had a long standing uh, interest in information. And uh, uh, looking at the description of the panel, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all over the lot. <laughs> so I will have comments on a number of, uh, number of aspects of it, but uh, basically I find it rather, rather incoherent. And, uh, uh, frankly, uh, also the introductory comments by Rodolfo, I, sh I should mention there, uh, uh, almost totally escaped me. Uh, the highly abstract, and uh, I guess that this is a difference between, you might say, the hard sciences and the social sciences. I'm a social scientist, and uh, so I'm glad that we're uh, at least appearing on a panel together, I hope that we might have some productive interchange. Uh, the title of the session says that you're seeking a balanced understanding of the global transformation, which will require the insights of both paradigms, the Anthropocene and the Newosphere. Uh, let me back up a moment. Uh, Ethics, I will deal with very quickly. Uh, essentially, it's doing what's right. There's many definitions of it. Uh, I hope that uh, global ethics are emerging, as uh, Ivan says, although I don't see any evidence of it at the moment in terms of the distribution of uh, COVID vaccines. It's a quite uh, strongly vaccine a nationalism or an occasional uh, vaccine diplomacy in the interests of the distributing country. Now, the Anthropocene, <clears throat> which uh, basically uh, has to do with the human species overwhelming the earth and doing a bad job of it. Uh, this, the, I know that scientists, I think at least a few years ago, they're still arguing as to whether or not to, uh, to uh, where, where this era deserves that label. But I think it's, it's coming into widespread acceptance, although just uh, mostly among uh, scientists. 
uh, a popular version is simply the widely cited preface to Stuart Brand's first Holworth catalog in 1968, in which he said, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. And uh, in 2009, uh, Stuart revised his statement to say, we are as gods and have to get good at it. Uh, I'll leave that for the moment and move on to the newosphere about uh, which I have a bit to say. Uh, I, I was struck when I saw the term because I haven't seen it in many decades. Uh, it, it, the dictionary definition is a sphere of human consciousness and mental activity in regard to influence on the biosphere and evolution. Uh, in context, it is coined by uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin who I believe is a Jesuit priest in 1949, published in France in 1956 and in the US in 1966 in a book called Man's Place in Nature. Ty Howard described five stages in the great spectacle of what he called anthropogenesis, a self involving world, development of the biosphere, the appearance of man, formation of the newosphere or thinking sphere, and the compression phase. The new sphere is seen as the final and supreme product in man, an irrepressible process of unification. Uh, put it in further context, Teilhard's new sphere was one of some 60 stage theories that were published in the mid 20th century. And like other uh, theories that all had a happy idealized ending with uh, no backsliding along the way. Uh, notably, uh, no more stage theories are offered today because the future has uh, become too uncertain and too full of unanticipated wicked problems, which are not, uh, I would uh, disagree, uh, they're not very rare. I think that uh, however you define them, that they're uh, an increasingly present, or at least the, they're described as, as wicked problems. Now, instead of uh, the newosphere, which is highly abstract, and uh, I'd also like to mention another, but far more practical version of what could be called the newosphere is the world brain, which is proposed by H.G. Wells in the 1936-1938 period. Uh, it was seen as, quote, an adequate knowledge organization for a great new world struggling into existence, a depot where knowledge and ideas are received, sorted, summarized, digested, clarified, and compared, a perpetual digest in touch with all the original thought and research in the world. Now at the 2005 uh, WAS conference in Zagreb, I proposed a world brain for the 21st century focused on human benefit knowledge. Also referencing uh, sociologist Robert Lynn's 1938 book, Knowledge for What? Questioning ever more what he called bricks of data on the growing pile of social science and calling for more synthesis and long range thinking. Sound familiar? I recommend both of these books very highly. They're still, still relevant. Uh, my essay was published in the October 2007 special issue of Futures Journal on uh, Knowledge Futures, which is edited by WASP President Walt Anderson. So th that's, that's background. Now the question, are the newosphere and or the world brain uh, still relevant in today's troubled times? And where did we go wrong? And I make uh, four quick points. Uh, first, obviously, there's been much growth and variation in the world of knowledge as well as information with more people and more scientists. So the, the community is far, far larger. Secondly, there's ever more fragmentation into what people commonly called silos in which uh, you surround yourself with a wall and you don't, uh, and you don't see what's outside. Uh, <clears throat> thirdly, there's not enough emphasis on uh, the negative trends which are uh, uh, creating the wicked problems which make these uh, nice long-term stage theories uh, irrelevant. And the fourth thing is that uh, there's really not enough time for these ideals. We need effective action now, as a, a number of people at this as meeting have, have noted. So what then are some of the right activities, uh, ethical activities that need to be done now? Uh, one of them is the 
Millennium Project, uh, Ivan Zagasti, uh, uh, this is Jerry Glenn's Millennium Project, right? Yes? Yeah, okay, you're, not, you're nodding your head and you, you, you went on to talk about other things, but I think that the project deserves uh, discussion, which maybe you, you'll do at some point, but he, Jerry and um, many other people have been working on it for uh, some 20 years, and uh, it's based around 15 global challenges. And the important thing is that there's what now 63 nodes in the project uh, in which this is disseminated worldwide, which is uh, very effective. So uh, for, for this information system. However, uh, I'll, I'll begin with my own information system, the Security and Sustainability Guide to some 2,500 organizations that are concerned with uh, the broad realm of security thinking and or sustainability, and hopefully we'll get people to think about both. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, at this conference, a lot of people are talking about human security and, uh, or humanity security. So this is a very crowded subsystem of what could be called today's newosphere. And to sort this out, we've identified some 50 or 60 notable organizations, which is still a big mouthful. And we have three indexes to help people get around. We have a dashboard of generic categories, a major categories index, including a long list of alliances and consortia, and a subject index of some 600 and 700 entries. Now, this is still a lot to handle, so increasingly we're focusing on reports, which are published free online by groups of scientists and other experts from UN agencies, the World Economic Forum, World Wildlife Fund, the IUCN, the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network, the Stockholm Resilience Center, et cetera, et cetera, and other groups. Uh, the top 25 are by, by choice of the global of reports on the global environmental emergency were published in the October uh, 2019 issue of Cadmus. Uh, have you folks, um, do you know of it? Have you ever seen it? Was it useful? Yes, all, most of us do. Good. Well, I don't know if most of us, but, uh, but at least you do. And I, uh, at least I have most of them spun out, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, the problem is there's so much information and it's, it's difficult to get uh, feedback on, on this. Uh, also, most recently, I was uh, dragged in because I'm interested in what's happening. I was dragged into following uh, the COVID and I did a compendium of uh, 66 COVID related reports, uh, which is uh, the featured lead item on the homepage of our website, uh, securesustain.org. And uh, it has an organization index, 18 highlight items and seven categories and daily data, scenarios, general overviews, reopening society, special perspectives, large group agendas and pre-COVID warnings. Um, the brief version was published in Cadmus in, in fall 2020. Again, I asked the question, do you know of it? Have you ever seen it? Uh, was Very it useful. useful? We, we told to, okay, and the others are, are silent about it, uh, and you know it might not necessarily be your thing, but maybe maybe it or maybe it ought to be. And then a question: How can it be made better? How can I get get this out? But it's uh, you know I raised the question in Cadmus: uh, Can sixty six um, COVID reports make a difference? And I still have no idea uh, whether anybody read read my brief essay in Cadmus or or whether these reports uh, get out to the right, right, uh, right people somehow. So in an info uh, saturated world, I contend that it is a right thing, not the right thing, but one of the right things to do is to start with these well-written collective efforts and build on them or critique on them if, if you disagree. We need more critique to get out of our boxes. More generally, to phrase the old slogan of, uh, of the telephone company in the US, they would always say, reach out and touch somebody. That's back when they're charging for long distance calls. And I like the slogan, reach out and cite someone. It's not only reports, but important books of articles. Uh, scholarship and science in general ought to be a collective endeavor. 
But too many people present their ideas with no references, which is to me just an exercise in silo building. Also, you, I don't think you should dismiss ideas of non-scientists. For example, is uh, Bill Gates uh, has a book that was just published this week called How to Avoid a Climate Disa Disaster, which I believe have many ideas on needed technologies such as green concrete. concrete. I just saw him uh, 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 promoting it on a talk show the, uh, yesterday. As for science and technology for human security, we need a world today of, of uh, a world body of some sort that is engaged in technology assessment, which is modeled on the United States Office of Technology Assessment that existed in the 1980s and 1990s. This won't har halt harmful technologies, but it can put brakes on some of them while promoting more useful technologies. So in sum, I repeat again, we are as gods and we have to get good at it. And I'd add, do it soon. If you can order a better slogan for our times that can be widely shared across borders, please do so. It is the right thing to do to promote global security. My candidate for a slogan is grow up, get real. What is yours? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so <clears throat> I would like to introduce to you the next panelist. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce uh, another distinguished um, representative of this society that is um, <clears throat> Carlos Alvarez uh, Pereira, uh, who is on the executive committee. Uh, he is with the Club of Rome uh, and interests, uh, very diverse interests with a tremendous insight from what I've heard from him and I read from him, uh, very insightful possibilities that we should engage. Uh, uh, Carlos, would you be kind enough to share your thoughts with us? Well, dear Vitold, I will try to live up to this presentation. Thank you and to this friendly presentation of yours. So, you make me think, um, which is the best compliment I, I, can, I can make to anybody. And I didn't have a very precise set of things to say. I was more prepared to react on what I heard, which is basically what I will do. And I would like to build on um, my friend Rodolfo's uh, ideas, and in particular on something which I think is fundamental. Uh, which is the idea that we have to go for a new hermeneutics, I would say a new epistemology. And actually, it's not so new, it's uh, simply that we have to learn what we already know. There is a huge amount of knowledge, Rachel Carson said that in, in 1962, I think, or 64. Uh, we have the knowledge we need, uh, we simply don't use it. And learning is something else. It's not, learning is not knowing. Knowing consciously something is not enough. It doesn't imply necessarily that you change your patterns. Learning for me is changing our patterns as a consequence of what we know. And this is to a large extent not happening because we are stuck in an outdated epistemology which is ultimately based on something which coming from science, but science of uh, two or three centuries ago. So it is using the excuse of science uh, to keep framing how we think, how we organize ourselves, how we act, how we design policies to say something and how we act. And that epistemology, which is still there and is persistent, you know, is the epistemology of rationalism, of dualism, as Rodolfo rightly pointed out. You, you know, there is no duality between matter and mind. I think we know that, but we are still there using uh, this idea of rationalism, objectivity, separation. There is a common characteristics to the different dimensions of that epistemology, which is separation. 
And if I look into what could be ethical as far as our world is concerned, um, I would say the first thing I would say is, well, to overcome that epistemology based on separation, it's an epistemology which has made the world a culture, a dominant culture based on competition and the perception of scarcity. And we have to overcome that. Um, how? By, by, you know, marrying uh, modern science to alternative worldviews which have been there since the beginning of times. So it's as much, I say, as much modern science as Ubuntu to say something representative, you know, the African concept of Ubuntu, I am because you are, um, is there since the very beginning and it's representative of a different epistemology based on relationality, on relationships, where the, the, the object of, uh, of life, the way life expresses itself is through relationships rather than through in separate individuals. And with this lens, you can look into almost any field you want, and in particular, the field of the relationship between ethics and information. If I look at ethics first, my proposal of overcoming separation implies also something uh, which is, let's overcome the separation between ethics, epistemology, and ontology. We are still using these categories, you know, that we still think in terms of, oh, there is a reality, something which is ontology. There is epistemology, so the, the things we know about that reality, which is separate. And the more we go forward, the more we know, so we, we get closer to, to what is. And then there is a third level, which is ethics, which is, okay, with what we know about what is, what should we do? If you look at this from the perspective of life and complexity, and complexity is not an issue, there are no weak problems. There are no problems and solutions. There, are, there is life, life evolving. And you may say there are questions and responses, but the responses change also the questions. So it never stops. The process of evolution never stops. There is never a solution. This is still very academic. You know, we were receiving in the exams, we were asked to find solution for a well-defined problem. Let's forget about that. Uh, let's admit that complexity is the foundation of life and with all, or with the characteristics which come with it, including emergence, including unpredictability, including creativity because we invoke creativity but when you look at that from the perspective of a reductionistic or you know a rationalistic perspective it's weird because creativity is exactly the denial of the rationalistic framework um, so let's make clear that there is no difference between ethics um, epistemology and ontology because we don't have an access to reality. We only receive perceptions from reality and we interpret these perceptions in frameworks of interpretation through hermeneutics. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting that Rodolfo says big data implies changing our hermeneutics, which means among other things that we have not changed uh, big data by itself and AI itself as it exists today has not been based, is not based on the change of hermeneutics and epistemology. It's not based on an epistemology of relationships rather than, rather than separation. And the other aspect I want to, well, the comment I want to make about information well, information is also based, the way we use it, the way we define it, the way we build it uh, is also based on, on separation. You know, it's mostly based on the idea that we can isolate certain objects, certain elements, for instance, individuals, and we can have information on them. And to do that, we 
we enforce, we artificially enforce the definition of boundaries. Boundaries between people, boundaries between countries, boundaries between whatever. While what is important in life is the relationships. So the, there is distinction. One tree is not the same as its neighbor in a forest. There is clear distinction, but there is no separation. And the more we look into uh, living beings like trees, the more we discover that our ideas about the rest of living beings were basically wrong. We thought we were separate from them. Uh, you know, a big uh, gap between humans and the rest of living beings. Well, we discovered that trees communicate with each other. And if, you, if we dig, we might discover, I think it is that way, that all living beings are sentient. All living beings have communication capacities. And in a way, all living beings are, are a part of mind in the sense that Gregory Bateson gave to that, uh, to that idea, to that concept, which by the way is a derivative of the noosphere. Uh, just to be fair, um, let's mention Vladimir Vernadsky as one of the fathers of the elaboration of the concept of noosphere in collaboration with Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. But so separation is now embedded in, in almost everything we do. And we have to get out of that, of that trap, because this is a trap uh, which, has less, which has led us uh, to where we are today, to the mess in which we are. And by the way, uh, what is really interesting, I said, uh, we are using the excuse of science to continue working with this epistemology but science itself, and in particular physics, knows very well and since long that the, the framework of the epistemology of classical mechanics has a limited domain of applicability. And physics has been able to develop new paradigms. Um, but as far as our social systems, institutions, ways of understanding reality are concerned, we, we are still, still there. And the word, Anthropocene is again, uh, in my view, an example, an example of that. Because, you know, isn't that a paradox that we call Anthropocene an era in which we are showing our capacity to commit suicide at the scale of the species? Some people say, oh, Anthropocene, that will be the shortest geological eras of all because it will only last maybe for one century or two you know so we put man the humans but the man in particular at the center of everything emphasizing our capacity to influence uh, the rest of uh, the planet while what we are doing is is committing suicide uh, isn't that a paradox and i want to finish with uh, just an additional provocation and a, an example of what I mean when I say information as we define it is based on the, on the enforcement on the artificial enforcement of boundaries. Definitely in the special uh, sense of the term, this, these are the limits of who I am. I have my physical limits, so I am, I am somebody, not taking into account that any one of us is an ecosystem. Um, in dynamic equilibrium with our zillions of bacteria which live in, inside us, but also boundaries in time. And if you, uh, the way I explain this is if I show you a picture with uh, three apples and I ask you how many apples there are in the picture, the natural thing is to ask, to answer three. My take is you cannot count the apples which are in the picture. If you, take, if you take into account the most important and generally most ignored dimension, which is time and all, we, all which comes with it, entropy, etc., 
if you take into account uh, the dimension of time, you can never count any number of living beings because in that picture with time, there will be, there could be an infinite number of adults. So, and I stop here. So this is my final example of, uh, let's be, let's question the way we separate ourselves from everything else, including time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Uh, I would like to restart a very short round, second round. Um, as you know, the uh, time is coming to, uh, our allotted time is coming to an end. Uh, it will be in five minutes. However, the next session in this uh, category will start uh, in uh, 15 minutes after the hour. So we would have some, some extra time if we would be allowed to do so and if you uh, are willing to do so. Uh, but perhaps we could really go um, through the cycle again if, if you have anything to add. Um, uh, Ulika, could, could you uh, comment? Uh, would you like to have any comments on what was said and where we are going, how this um, session is evolving in terms of con concepts and actions for the future? Or anybody else? Yvonne, there's, there's a reference again by Michael to, um, uh, to the Millennium Project. Maybe you could comment a little bit more. Sure. Could you uh, yourself? Yes, thank you. Sure. Uh, um, I, I wanted to, to continue with my, my point from, from the previous uh, round uh, and, and go um, ahead a little bit mainly on uh, bringing the, the potential strategies to, to address this, this big challenge we, we are facing. So uh, in, in the case of uh, what we called in the Millennium Project Challenge uh, 15, uh, uh, as I was uh, pointing out before, how can ethical considerations become more routinely incorporated into global decisions? Uh, the actions we, we are proposing to to address this uh, global challenge uh, are related to uh, the, the, following, the following strategies. First of all, to create an aud audit process procedures, sorry, to expose uh, ethical assumptions in algorithms. This is a, 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 clear, a clear first point. Establish an international, uh, international atomic energy agency-like system to deter cyber and information warfare. Enforce measures to reduce corruption, such as uh, those recommended by Transparency International. Require civics and ethics in all forms of education, focusing on making behavior match uh, the values people say they believe in. Promote parental guidance to establish a sense of values. Make ethics part of uh, performance evaluation criteria. Develop uh, new social contracts between governments and citizens' rights and responsibilities to prevent future forms of massively uh, destructive terrorism. Explore how transparency policies can be implemented. Use entertainment media to promote memes uh, like make decisions that are good for me, you and the world. Revoke corrupt officials travel visas. And finally, create better incentives for ethics in global decisions. So this is the, the list we, the list of strategies and actions we, we are proposing at global level. And um, I would like to also open the floor to, to the rest of the panelists to, to see if they, they agree with, with the Millennium Project on our uh, suggestions for humanity and, and the world. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Michael, would you like to comment a little bit more on the, um, uh, what, ought, what ought to be done from your perspective in order to achieve those goals? Um, not eventually, when we might not be around, but while we are still still can uh, talk about um, uh, Tyler de Chardin and the Russian influence and all of those influences on our thinking, um, so that 
that perspective would also be preserved. Could you unmute yourself? Yeah, I, well, I, I have uh, two questions uh, just to follow on to, to Ivan. I, I wondered if you could uh, briefly give uh, two or three examples of how the Millennium Project has been has changed policy in uh, any country worldwide. And then I have a question for Carlos also. Again, I'm looking for practical examples. We're talking about the new epistemology, which uh, sounds pretty elegant, but uh, there's uh, probably a lot to it. But he did mention something about uh, getting away from the dominant culture based on uh, competition and I guess capitalism. So here's a case in point of a report, which I will hold up. Uh, uh, right here, this is the uh, called Reinventing Capitalism, a Transformation Agenda from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It came out uh, in November, it has 33 pages, you can get it online, but this is uh, an illustration of the type of reports that I'm dealing with that I think that people ought to pay attention to. And if uh, this doesn't... Uh, <clears throat> get you excited, then uh, maybe you can do something that's even better in terms of a new epistemology. So, so I have questions to both Carlos and uh, Ivan. Sure. Um, shall I take first? Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, in the case of the Millennium Project, as you know, we, we work um, very actively with different uh, governments and, and global institutions in, in different continents. Uh, right now, as I think Jerry mentioned a few days ago in this uh, conference, uh, we are promoting uh, a global research on uh, how to address the transition from uh, narrow artificial intelligence into um, uh, general artificial intelligence and how to uh, address that, that in that uh, challenge in a, in a global perspective. So we are encouraging uh, governments and, and global institutions to, uh, to uh, cooperate with us in this, in this research because we think this is really a, a key issue for humanity. And this is following our, the results of our previous research on the future of work and technology 2050, our scenario work that you probably already know, and it's published at the uh, Millennium Project uh, website. Uh, this is uh, in the global perspective. Then at national level, uh, for instance, I am right now working for the uh, Colombia government. Uh, right now we are setting up a foresight unit at the uh, DNP, the Departamento Nacional de Planeación, which is the uh, president's office for planning. So um, we are trying to bring the uh, futures research uh, perspective into their um, uh, current and future uh, planning work on uh, public policies. So this is a, a large scale project. Yeah, whoa, we, whoa, we whoa, 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 whoa. Give me specific examples of say three governments where you have made a significant difference. I know in general, you're working with a lot of governments. <laughs> where? Okay, so uh, I Yvonne, uh, while you're thinking and have... looking for, for the examples, I would like, yes. to, and I would like to ask Carlos to, to think a little bit more um, yeah. about the answers. Uh, I would like to bring uh, Ulika for, uh, for a minute uh, to this discussion. So Ulika, could you, could you also see how though the, the whole process uh, could gel and could be done and could be effective. Yes, I, I didn't, I was not, uh, uh, I was unmuted. Uh, no, I was muted earlier. So yes. I, I yes. missed Go my ahead. turn. Yes, I wanted to, at that point, I wanted to uh, congratulate everybody for extremely interesting contributions uh, of different and complementary kinds. I thought that Michael Marion, he is a real locomotive when it comes to, uh, to information and you just churn out all these things and I think it's so valuable. I mean, we should really uh, uh, check these uh, 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 books and uh, uh, particularly these articles that you are referring to and you keep them in your head and you very quickly uh, inform us. But could you could you put a link or something on, on the chat so that we can access yes. them? 
Yes, we, we will lovely. put yeah. all of the links to the references. Uh, I have many of those links already, um, uh -huh. and uh, yes. Vani and uh, others will will really help in that process. Yes, uh, uh, yes. So, so that I think is very useful, and I'm very impressed also with Ebon's uh, 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 description and all these bullet points that you have about what can be done and so on. It's just remarkable. It's almost hard to process. So, I think that this satisfies very much. Uh, this like the second part of the of this project of this session, which has to do with global implementation and and, and, and global uh, uh, security and stuff, and and Carlos is somewhere there in the middle, uh, and 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 uh, and Rodolfo is at the beginning of like everything is up for grabs, you know, hooray! Uh, uh, we don't really know what we are doing, but we should, you know, we are exploring, and Carlos is mediating between what we know and what we where we are going in a, in a very pedagogical way, as usual. Thank you, Carlos. So I, I am enjoying this session very much. I'm sorry I spoke so long. I uh, did, should have kept an eye um, on the time. No, no, it's, it, it, was, it yeah. wasn't your fault. It was my miscalculated uh, yeah. misinformation, actually, <laughs> operated for uh, 30 seconds on misinformation. So uh, this was the result. We suffer yes. always from miscalculation. So uh, I, uh, that's more my <laughs> fault example. exclusively. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Yes. Um, Carlos, would, would you, uh, uh, was that enough time uh, to uh, answer the question? Unmute yourself, no, no, my, my, my answer is, thank you, Vitor. My answer was already <laughs> prepared. I mean, because it's not I, so- I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's not, uh, I mean, thank you for the question, uh, Michael. But um, so first on a comment on, on, the, on the reinventing capitalism. Um, and I'm well aware of what the of what the World Business Council does. Uh, this is, as you know, this is not the first time, and we we heard the same in 2009. And I think it is because some of the most lucid people, um, in 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 particular in the world of business, uh, realize that uh, we are uh, there are too many cracks now in the in the systems in, the, in in the human system. So something has really to be done. And, and their proposal is uh, as it was 10 years ago, but, uh, but nothing really happened or not much really happened. They are proposing to reinvent in capitalism. This is not a leap, a leap in sense making. This is um, the intention of adapting uh, the same framework we already have to the new context, but I'm not talking, I'm talking about something deeper than that. And I don't use the word capitalism because uh, the, world, the word is too, too much loaded, uh, among other things, because we tend to associate as not separable for once. I want to separate several, several things, which is when we talk about capitalism, we used to think that that means all companies and markets and what is actually capitalism, which is the idea that capital can reproduce itself. And in particular, financial capital can reproduce itself. And in my view, that idea, which is so much embedded in our, in our minds is a denial of the second principle of thermodynamics. No, sorry. Capital cannot reproduce itself unless you do many things. And you have always to take into account the consequences on the rest of uh, the world, the biosphere of, of uh, any process of reproduction, of fake uh, reproduction of capital. But so what I'm talking about is deeper than that, but it's not new, uh, as I said. Uh, it's not new and yet it's not uh, yet mainstream, unfortunately, and it builds on, it can, you can describe that as building on two different streams, one extremely old and one more recent. The one more recent look at cybernetics, you know, that we're, so we're talking about the 40s, the 1940s, 50s, 60s the works of people like uh, Norbert Wiener and Gregory Bateson. So not cybernetics as the origin of computer science as we know it today and making computers. Cybernetics 
as a perspective on epistemology in which, in which uh, feedback loops play a crucial role and the elaboration on that, second order, uh, third order, et cetera, cybernetics. Look also at the discipline, which is now also 60 years old, uh, complexity, so-called complexity science or complex systems thinking uh, and dynamical systems theory. If you want to name, I would put on the table Ilya Prigozhin, who elaborated, was Nobel, Nobel Prize in chemistry, elaborated very much about time as something which had been ignored in, in, in classical mechanics and which is a fundamental dimension and uh, criticality of systems and emergence. And he did a lot to reconcile, I would say, physics with biology. So modern science, that not all modern science, but a significant uh, stream of modern science already developed decades ago. And I said, there is a much older stream and the much older stream is the worldviews, the incredibly rich set of worldviews, which are kept alive in other cultures. Uh, we say indigenous cultures, but it's also the traditions of, uh, of, for instance, Asian cultures in which the role, the understanding of time, the role of time is completely different from ours. And the role of contradictions uh, is also uh, completely different from ours. And it is all the indigenous cultures on, on the earth, which are the resilient ones, sorry to say. They have been there for thousands of years. I'm not saying that we should go into the direction of living like uh, coming back to indigenous tribes, to the lifestyle of indigenous tribes. I'm saying that we have to explore and Ulika for sure, I am with Rodolfo, this is an exploration. We have to explore in the worldviews and the wisdom the, those peoples have, still have, and I mentioned Ubuntu and many other African concepts which are still alive in the way they organize themselves. Uh, they, they, they organize their, their societies and, uh, and build on that and look in that and leave the scripts of our industrial civilization. And that's my take. We have to do a, um, a huge effort of leaving aside the scripts of what we think we know uh, to, to learn. To learn thank you very much on this thank you very much carlos history. yeah sorry yeah thank well, you a bit, um, a bit longer <laughs> sorry uh we have um we have exceeded the time so can we stay for another few minutes i would like to say a few words too uh from my perspective um so i, I first of all and uh, rodolfo will also summarize this um i think there is there are many many inputs i would like to uh, get a few slides for you um, could we, could you allow me to share now? What I would like to do is look at, at the issue of our growth and possible connection with security. In this, uh, what is really happening, how it was happening, why we are here, and uh, possibly where we are uh, going. Um, I, from all of the discussions I, I heard that there is lots of um, trust and confidence that we would overcome the difficulties. I'm not sure about it anymore. Um, if recent events clearly demonstrate to me that we alone may be lost sooner than we should. So uh, we need some help. Um, I've introduced ideas of cognitive digital twins but they're symbiotic. As those that also not only interact with uh, our colleagues and uh, our brothers and sisters, but also among themselves and would be able to protect us in a way that we ourselves are clearly demonstrating and have demonstrated are incapable of doing it. So let's look at the changes. 
the automation due to revolutions uh, have, have replaced many jobs. People are losing the sense of why we are here based on jobs as if it was the, the measure. Knowledge explosion is so massive that we no longer are genetically prepared for absorbing even a small tiny fragment of it. Misinformation has messed up all of the uh, issues of what is, and that goes to the first discussion that we had today. And the question is how should we learn to exist? So those changes from mechanization, then mass production, need for people on assembly lines has moved more and more to replacement now. Robots can do many things better than we can or could even dream about, but also have totally incapable of doing that until the era of, um, of the new, new components where not only big data play a role, not only information, the ability to extract patterns from the massive data plays a role, not only then transformation of information into knowledge plays a role, and not only the transformation then of knowledge into wisdom or um, those uh, components that make us smile to, towards others and where the lights get in, gets in finally uh, makes role. This process now requires rethinking of many, many issues. We have moved, and I place the, the biggest transformation uh, in the communication area and the connectivity, not disconnectivity as we intended, but um, uh, the actual connectivity that is intended. Uh, uh, Homer um, talked about three things that happened 3,000 years ago. We communicated there, but we could not move around that quickly. That now has changed. That was the Opta project that showed how we are connected. And that specific structure does not resemble random network of Erdos. This is a very highly connected mm, uh, system that has evolved without a central authority. It is evolved because of the rules that we've heard today very, very, very frequently. Uh, what is also important is not that we did not stop at that specific level of connectivity, but the discovery that all our proteins, that's schizophrenic interaction between all of the proteins um, in that process is also somewhat related to it. That this specific component of connecting in a beautiful way, hierarchical way, um, may be something that could help us. So the, when it happened, um, I thought that tribalism would go, would vanish. It was inevitable, it didn't. Uh, I thought that all of the collaboration and cooperation specifically would really grow by leaps and bounds and, and it is happening to some extent as we heard. Um, that the ability to actually realize that we, as it used to be, not only tell the story, the, our ability to tell the story, but actually help our, uh, those in needs would really also evolve. And I'm not sure whether it's evolving. Um, then we should really learn and comprehend now in a way that was never available, are we? So, this was then the wrench that was thrown into the system is that the discovery that all of that beauty could be used for total misguided guided, uh, direction. So much so since all of the originators of it clearly knew that we can't comprehend. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough roadmap maps to distinguish between all truth and all misinformation and we could really fall into that trap. So we need help. We already have digital twins. Every move that we make on the network is monitored. And uh, again, I thought initially that it would be transformed into something that would be very useful. Yeah, it is transformed into slavery 4.0, where we are being sold, monetized, not sold, monetized without knowing, without permission. This is not possible for us to stop. How can we stop? We need help. Those changes also indicate, indicate that one job 
from the past per lifetime is now converted into three to 10 jobs. How can we teach, teach for 10 jobs? What has to be done? How can we assure security in that process, ethical or not? So this is a, a very pragmatic issue now for me. The, the um, like Bucky uh, discovered that obviously our linear proportion and growth is no longer uh, true. Well, doubling of knowledge in 12 hours, we are not set to do an, almost anything. What was useful, coherent in the past for a lifetime, now it's spread. Um, I introduced over here no longer STEM, but STEAM, that arts ought to play a critical role that will uh, uh, alert us to various things and would help us in that growth. But the, uh, the impossibility of actually absorbing all of it and cope with it and, and still survive without doing uh, uh, choosing other options um, will have to be helped, augmented in a very big way. So the process of learning from the past, teacher to a student, one-to-one, -one, has then been uh, design, was designed to live together, to perform too, but to primarily know, understand, and create in that primitive environments that might have existed then, was transformed into um, the Prussian model of, of teaching and learning of one teacher teaching as many as possible. Throughout many, many of my conferences and, and interactions, I see that we are still embedded in that 300 year old model, uh, delivering to millions as if it was the way to, to learn, as if it was ever intended to acquire knowledge. It, uh, we have to somewhat see that performance skills are not sufficient to, for our survival. We ought to move from this model that was good for a long time, play, learn, work, and retire. Never feed any of the experience into the minds of young people who are seeking for models of experience, where the sub separate uh, activities of uh, learners and practitioners and companies uh, were based on non-interaction, not interaction. This has to be done. We have to obviously move into the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and even transhuman, uh, transhumanity of that is now on the table too. We have to use all of the potential projects that exist now to move into that direction where experiential learning plays a big role. These are some of the examples of my uh, dealings with indigenous students developing um, learning processes, discovery processes, developing new satellites. That's our satellite. We're now in the fifth generation, plays a big role to many, many people. They find ways of, of finding solutions that did not exist, learning to do that. So moving from that single job to many jobs, but this required and evolved into continuing education. I don't think that continuing education is sufficient uh, for today. We have to move into lifelong learning, never stopping, always learning at all possible way that will require a knowledge-based um, uh, approach to it. And with many other also changes of life uh, year round education and learning but above all to the issue of personalization, moving from the one fits all to one fits one. Um, this uh, component was started by, uh, as many of you know, by our uh, grandfathers in, in psychology, but then Fred Keller. I was a student, uh, a, a intellectual student of, of Fred and developed new successors of his approaches to personalization where body of knowledge played a role body of experience didn't. We have to move now into new solutions that are no longer the Industrial Revolution 5 by cognitive revolution, rethinking the future in a radical fashion. In my book, this will require a shift as we heard today and throughout the conference to issues of knowledge revolution and cognitive revolutions. The two are not the same. Uh, where symbiotic cognitive systems will play a role. Uh, eudaimonic uh, cognitive systems will play a role, where cognitive and mimetic systems will start playing a bigger role. At that level, 
we are reaching the, the idea of a symbion. Uh, we, I won't have the time to present to you what symbionts are in detail, but they are our neighbors. Uh, these are our brothers and sisters. Uh, and those brothers and sisters will really start from all of these institutions interacting together, uh, moving things closer and closer to the reality of interacting and helping us, learning about us, not only those that are experienced, but those who are developing from kindergarten to primary schools. This could really, will, could, will have to lead to an education fabric of learning fabric, learning for survival, learning for living. In that symbiotic education, not only there is a body of knowledge, but there is a body of experience and there is a body of, of, of uh, security, sustainable security. And then obviously there is a question of it, in that uh, of how to deliver it. But in that process, many of them, many of the tools already exist. Um, we have to really change our approach of to really find meaningful life with others, where knowledge and understanding is not just a matter of skills alone, but the creation of all of the solutions of how to replace something that exists or how to create something that never existed. And in this, I think there is the need to move away from the older uh, shackles of, of education to new freedom. Um, yes, in that flight, we can melt our wax and fall, but there is a chance that that will be our family. This will be our brothers and sisters that we would really be able to, uh, to live. So the other co core concept, not only lifelong learning for the sake of that, but we have to transform. Um, Eric Fromm asked us to look into to have or to be, to consume or to be. Many of us know w which direction to choose. Um, I was always fascinating with this distinction, not only I, that has been mastered in a way that probably no other generation has mastered today. I, I alone means nothing, but I and you, but you as thou means everything to me. That it also, uh, we have to get rid of the shackles of freedom from. That distinction was brought by Berlin. Freedom from. I want to be free to, freedom to do something, to change something that we consider to be too difficult. The other fundamental concept is if we'll start talking to ourselves with our age, it's too late. We have to be, we have to provide projects so that that girl's life was changed probably forever. That is what I would like to also bring finally to our consideration that it is a planetary moment. There is us, that blue pale blue dot was taken when our camera was just leaving our system. That is the blue dot said, look at it again. That's here, that's home, that's us. It is worthwhile to work, worthwhile to live, worthwhile to work to our, to our last moment to help the next generation. I have, graduate, I have graduate students, but I also have grandchildren. I want them to look at that pale wild dot and say, we are here still. And there's a reason we are here. It is reason is you tomorrow. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Dr. Kinston, we need to start our next session now. Yeah, I just want to finish to close so thank this, you. this session with a little warning to all participants. That is, if we assume that we have all the knowledge to solve current problems, then we perpetrate the scatter's error. Think about it. Thank you for your participation. It was so rich and many brilliant perspectives that 
I think that uh, we need to uh, replicate many times uh, this opportunity just to dig deeper. Thank you for your participation. Thank you all. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Julian, Barry, and Nora. Yes. Hi. Good to see you. Actually, Rami uh, canceled, as he saw. So, yeah. yeah. Rami and Piero. But I think we have a lot to talk about anyway. You know, so <laughs> we don't need nine people. We've only got, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Hello, Nora. <laughs> Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. What's the um, order here? How are we going to dance? Are we, oh, okay, I, I get. I thought they were. I was going to start us off. I thought that um, that someone from WAS would introduce us, but I'll I'll just get going since since we're all here. Um, you want to provide the bigger oh, picture? Yeah, yeah. Pardon me. I'll talk if about you want the bigger picture. the bigger picture and the you know the content like we spoke about. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to frame up the panel and then we'll work through a series of questions. Okay, so. Um, Welcome to the WASP panel on culture and system change. We have a group of distinguished panelists. Um, I, two of our panelists, Piero and Rama, were unable to make it because of illness and power outages. Nadine Bloak is, is going to replace Peter Joseph on the panel. Uh, Julene and I, the co-moderators, look forward to learning more about your ideas and work. I'll frame up the session with a th few thoughts about system change then we'll progress through a series of questions that will guide the panel. I was moved by many of the comments in Monday's opening sessions. Ivo Slaus said that society will end in 10 years if we do not change our economic and political paradigms. Yeah. Alberto Zucconi said that we are at war with each other in nature. Many people even are at war with themselves. Our disempowering culture and high stress society fill many people with inadequacy, fear, and unhappiness. But in spite of these problems, I was uplifted by the excellent opening video. Gary Jacobs discussed the tremendous progress of humanity. We've accomplished many things that once seemed impossible. Jonathan Granoff said that we have the ability to end poverty and hunger and resolve all major challenges. The transdisciplinary approach of WAS is essential for the progress of humanity. I feel it's an honor to be part of the Academy and its noble mission. The subject of our panel, system change, is broad. It can mean many things and refer to many levels, from the individual to the whole system. System change related topics, such as systems theory and economic reform, have been addressed at least since the 1970s. Humanity has experienced system change throughout history, especially since the agricultural revolution when we started violating the laws of nature. System change can happen in two basic ways, voluntary or involuntary. High level system change, such as economic and political change, often happens involuntarily and quickly. Examples include the American and French revolutions, the end of slavery in the US and the collapse of communism in the USSR. Changing overarching systems can seem overwhelmingly complex this makes voluntary system change difficult. Vested interests often fight to maintain current systems. This is a main reason why high level system change often happens quickly. Vested interests block change until resistance becomes futile, then systems quickly collapse. If current systems change involuntarily through collapse, we could face unprecedented suffering and chaos because human society is larger and more interconnected than ever before and we are close to or beyond many environmental and social tipping points. Things are accelerating. We almost certainly have entered the phase of involuntary high level system change. As Evo said, we probably don't have much time to convert it to voluntary system change. Many factors indicate that involuntary system change has begun, including COVID and the rapid decline of democracy in the US. Millions of people were emotionally manipulated 
by deceptive media into supporting President Trump's anti-democratic efforts to overturn a fair election that he lost. Climate change is just one of the many rapidly growing environmental, social, and eco economic challenges facing humanity. As others have said at the conference, reductionistic thinking and the flawed systems that inevitably result from it are the root causes of these challenges. Flawed economic and political systems unintentionally compel companies to degrade the environment and society. System change is the most important action needed to resolve major challenges. As Alberto said, we cannot achieve system change through reductionistic approaches. This is what caused the problems in the first place. All major aspects of society are connected. As a result, whole system approaches are needed. We'll discuss this in our panel. Three key issues about system change are collaboration, culture, and process versus content. Collaboration is essential for achieving high level system change. No organization or even segment of society can change overarching systems on their own. Regarding culture, current society is a reflection of our reductionistic thinking. All voluntary change begins in the mind. We must change at least some minds to change our systems. Regarding system change process versus content, many system change approaches focus on the process of initiating and managing collaborative system change efforts. Content refers to the actual system changes needed. Most system change processes have a contextual phase that identifies systemic barriers and necessary changes. In other words, process often precedes content, but content frequently should take priority. Identifying content up front illuminates optimal system change processes and participants. One goal of this session is to help WASC consider how to address system change in culture. Our panelists are doing excellent work in this area. Possibly we could suggest helping to move this work along. Julene also suggested establishing an online system change group. As we move through the panel questions, please introduce yourselves and limit your comments to a few minutes. We'll each have several opportunities to share. In addition to being moderators, Julene and I are panelists. Julene, would you like to address the first question? What is system change and how can it be achieved? Sure, thank you, Frank, for that great introduction. Indeed, we are in a planetary moment and systems change um, the way I've done it, um, aligned with you is putting humanity and the environment at the center and essentially looking at what's blocking human and environmental um, flourishing. And the model that I've been working with is centered around epidemiology or public health. Uh, because I work a lot with the arts and there is a lot you can do uh, for the brain, for different diseases, for acting on social detriments of health um, with the arts. And especially since we're talking about a process of behavioral change, right? Understand changes within ourselves, changes within information, reordering bodies of knowledge. There's a lot that we can do for narrative change, um, change in mindsets, catalyzing social movements um, with the arts. So that's most definitely been my work. Um, understanding that mechanisms and mindsets are systems change. So the first part that I just spoke about, mindsets, mindsets and behavior. Um, the second set is um, mechanisms, how institutions can act violently on populations. Um, as creating a metrics of index, um, over 50 indicators, for um, looking at how um, to better align institutions um, with the natural world. Essentially, we institutionalize what we understand. Um, and at the heart of an institution is um, the incentives. What are the incentives behind it? What are, um, and how sustainable are those? What um, is the level dialogue is a key uh, point. Anti-dialogic institutions um, are, uh, lack the, yeah, I, I won't get too much into the met metrics of it, but essentially what we're talking about with systems change is addressing uh, mindsets, behavior, social processes, and institutional and structural change. Because we can talk about catalyzing change with the arts, but I think what also we have to talk about is how are social forces being mobilized? They're being mobilized by the incentives of our institutions, which are in fact, you know, 
incentives such as limitless growth are completely unsustainable. You only have to look at the statistics on work-related trauma to know that you know, the way institutions are operating is in fact detrimental to public health. So systems change the way that I look at it. The two main facets that I've been looking at are um, behavioral, um, a behavioral and mindsets culture and institution and structural change and how we can actually how injustice is in fact rooted in systems architecture, in the very architecture of our global systems and our most predominant and powerful systems, and how we can go about a process, a process of moving from one system to the next through the metrics that I've been building with institutional you know, indicators, as well as processes with behavior and mindset. So that's my take on it. But I know we have some very brilliant people um, here today. Um, the base of my approach is both mechanisms and mindsets. And in particular, with the arts, I look at reordering knowledge, reordering narratives, um, how institutions value certain forms of knowledge and degrade others, and how that relates to the way that we degrade um, different populations, cultures, that host different types of knowledge. So, I mean, that's a very, very high level, but I hope I can, uh, I'm bringing up the knowledge uh, point because I know Nora Bateson is here and she's done some great work in that kind of area. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there because I know we have, that, that's a high level summary, but uh, I'll pass it over. Maybe maybe Nora, if you want to, if you want to take up uh, um, just a, a high level summary as well from you. Sure. We can move through the panel. Yeah. Is, is that okay? Is that, is that yes. how we're doing yes. this? We're doing, okay. Um, well, first of all, it's great to be with all of you. And, uh, and of course, this is a very important conversation. Um, and it's a, it's a tricky conversation. It's a tricky conversation because the urgency as you've already stated, is um, is creeping up fast, and I think, you know, we're no longer talking about when we're in systems transformation; we're in it. Uh, so, who are we? How are we in it? Uh, to this is the question that for me right now. What is it? Um, I, don't, I don't think we're going to be creating systems change. We're our, it, it, the systems are already changing. At this point, the question is how are we um, in relation to those institutions that are shifting in relation to each other, in relation to previous and future generations, in relation to the natural world and the land. Uh, most importantly, in relation to uh, a, a whole ecology of ideas. And some of those ideas that are the most pernicious and dangerous are actually ideas about change. Ideas about being actors and agents of change. Ideas about being instigators and doers and leaders of change. Ideas that position the human experience in direct contrast to the type of patternings and relationings that we see in a living system, in a meadow, in a forest. What is change? What does it mean to have agency? I mean, I think these are some questions that, uh, that, that, it, that require some very careful thinking. Um, one of the spooky things that I'm finding right now is that a good deal of the discussion around systems transformation is actually populated with a very trendy language. And these languagings are, unfortunately, they were words that were pulled in by, you know, are the sort of the, the old guard of the people who, who created cybernetics, systems theory, complexity theory, some chaos theory. Um, and they're kind of mixed with some indigenous languaging as well. Um, they very little 
uh, I think very little um, tribute is given to the, the depth of indigenous understanding of systems change. But I'm concerned about the language. I'm concerned about the way in which we could use systems theory and complexity theory as a way to engineer, manage, and otherwise control systems change. Um, and the reason this is of great concern is because in fact, those intentions are the same kind of intentions that got us here to begin with. So there's a very real possibility that in our attempt to create systems change, we're perpetuating the existing systems in some of the worst possible ways. Um, the amount of competition in the field of collaboration is fantastic right now. Um, the, the lack of integrity in actually the, the change maker space. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of, of I, I think, very real danger that if there is not an uptick in care and attentiveness, not only to the language, but to each other, um, and, and to the way in which even our description of systems change holds a perception, okay? It holds a perception. And that perception is not of the real world. That perception is of our perceptions. And I, I'm not trying to be tricky here. This is a very real issue. Our capacity to observe is actually through the filters of our pa past. And so anything that we observe and describe is going to be contaminated with those impulses in some very good ways and also in some dangerous ways. So I think that for me, I know there's a lot that all of you are gonna bring up. So this is something I can pop in that's a little different to just say, I think we have to be really careful right now. Um, and uh, I'll stop there. Um, I think there's beautiful things happening and we should, yeah, care is needed. Thank you, that, that's a fantastic point about the idea that the current system change, change in uh, processes might actually be uh, keeping current systems in place. I, I'd love to explore that one more. But as we work down, through the agenda, answering the first question, what is system change and, uh, and how can it be achieved? Um, Barry, would you like to go next? All right, thank you. Um, as you asked, I'll um, introduce myself as people may not know me. Um, uh, I'm um, the editor in chief of a, a multidisciplinary journal published by Routledge, which is called Globalizations. And um, I'm a professor of uh, global development studies at the University of Helsinki and a founding member and director of the Global Extractivisms and Alternatives Initiative. So I, I want to say, and, and also in my earlier days in youth, I, was, I worked on world system theory without a hyphen with the late Andre Gunder Frank um, rather extensively. So I, you know, I, take the, I take a very long durée view of um, the world system. Uh, so I, I wanted to pose First, the difference between system change and system transformation, because you can distinguish intellectually I and mean, conceptually between change within a system, you know, a system which is basically got a, a structure which continues to reproduce itself where there's continuity. There may be patterns, cycles, secular trends, rhythms, etc., periodic crises, but it, within the same system. And then you have radical system change, or you know, I actually want to discuss the the utility of using the term system transformation, because it looks like we are talking about, I think I agree with Ivo Slaus and many others that look, um, this is an absolutely pivotal uh, period in human history, uh, full, full scale, you know, of, of all periods of human history, this one is uh, an acute existential crisis. Okay, now that's a starting point, we know that. The particular system that we have now that we've inherited that's accelerated its extractivist and destructive ecological ecocide tendencies in the last 50 years or even 30, uh, it's now imploding. And my view is it's in a, it's what I call a great implosion. It's, and every effort 
to you know keep it um, sustained in its without any radical change to the structure um, will fail. So we do face this uh, really intense moment for mobilization. So I wanted to say something about that because we all know that um, you know if you read uh, everybody's looked at Stefan Etol's article on trajectories of the Earth system in the Anthropocene and some other things that people have done of similar kind and that carbon brief, there are now maps of the, of the tipping point zones across the world. Tim Linton did you know, years ago and so on. Now we now know that look, uh, this situation is far more dangerous even than the, the matter of uh, greenhouse gases per se or carbon reductions per se or decarbonization. It really has to do with ecological restoration which is now absolutely imperative to that it happen on a planetary scale. I mean, you've probably seen that uh, David Attenborough's film, A Life on This Planet, and now he has a new series. I mean, it's, it's his life testimony. He's seen it happen. He documents it. People can now see it on the film and, and maybe help to understand the moment, the planetary moment that we're in. So, I mean, as far as like what I would call about system transformation now, it really is about, and I think most of us would probably agree, it obviously is about overcoming the false economic paradigm where you have inbuilt externalities that are um, a fiction. You know, the, the idea that uh, you know, all the damage you do to the environment is somehow not in the accounting model, so it doesn't matter. But that's, uh, that's not even real. Of course it matters. And we now know about planet, planetary boundaries, tipping points, thresholds, and the interactions between all of those because it's one integrated system. It just, just is, that's the truth. So we really have a huge task of transformation. I'm kind of inspired by, I mean, we need to reimagine civilization. The Nora is part of that project we're doing. Um, in what ways, but like uh, um, David Wallace Wells in that book, The Uninhabitable Earth, uh, which I hope you've, you've read, um, one of the things he concludes on at the end, after cataloging all the dire uh, trajectories of the data tells us that we're experiencing or happening. He concludes on saying, there's one thing about climate models, you know, however sophisticated they are, and they, they become ever more so. There's the, the most important single variable that isn't in them happens to be us. And that happens to be the human agency, the human will, the human mentality, a, a spiritual and mental revolution long overdue and it's in a way it's uh, maybe full circle with certain kinds of ancient indigenous cosmovisions and understanding the earth as a sacred web of life, which it is, or I think it is, many people do. We have to return to that, that um, attitude and then act. So, I mean, I'm very encouraged by multi-convergences that I see happening. There are many of them, like whole you know, networks of networks. And uh, I was just at the virtual world social forum not very long ago. And there was, a, there was a panel that I participated in on like a global dialogue process between about eight multi-convergence initiatives around the world. Um, you know, this kind of thing is happening. And, and the last thing I'll say is that one, one great advantage I think we have at this moment and we have to use for everything is worth is that we're, we have now an enabling technology like we're using right now, um, which uh, you know, amplifies the ability of human reflexivity and uh, uh, accelerates our ability to learn. And then our ability to uh, reach common understandings and then take collective action. Uh, and that even on a planetary coordinated basis, which we're gonna have to do as well as all the kind of local actions, but I don't believe in any uh, reality. But I think the global is always instantiated or embedded in the local. So I don't, I think it's a false dichotomy to say local versus global. I don't, I don't agree with that, I never have. So I think I'll leave it at that. You know that, that we, you know, we have to move to a new paradigm of Earth stewardship. This is clear. We have to radically change the practices on fossil fuels, on land use, uh, you know, agro, uh, agriculture, forestry. You, you know, you, you know all this. Uh, it's comprehensive, <laughs> and that's the challenge. And uh, in a way, you know, it's imperative. We don't really have a choice if we're sane. Uh, and we take a moral stance because I mean I'm, I have a four-year-old granddaughter, and uh, you know by the end of the century, I hope she'll be alive. She'll be uh, in her 80s. This, in other words, this century is her life. Mm -hmm. So, like I like that uh, old saying that comes from indigenous people that you know we don't inherit the land from our ancestors; we borrow it from our children. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barry. I knew this was going to be a rich panel. 
Petra, would you like to take the uh, go next with the first question? What is system change and how can we achieve it? Yeah, I can actually very much relate to, to what has been said so far. So I'm Petra, I'm the executive director of the Collective Leadership Institute. We are internationally operating NGO and in a lot of transformation processes that are, if you consider systems change small, but there are big systems like the cocoa value chain, the coffee value chain, educational systems, etc. So, and and why this is so important is that what I have what I've learned from these uh, transformation processes that that seem to be small, <laughs> but they aren't actually they're usually complex uh, with multiple stakeholders, is that indeed and and I agree with with Nora and uh, with with Julian here and and very I think you also touched on this that there is a unique combination that we need to bring into stronger awareness. And that's my first point. Uh, that is the connection between self, between system, whatever the larger system is, you know, it would be organizational, it could be local, it could be global, and the process, because the process is, is so increasingly important because if we do the process like we did the old, then we're going to create the old. So we need to do the processes so that they model the new and not the old. And that is in itself a huge learning process, you know, for which we don't really have um, kind of <laughs> entire answers. So in my experience, what really helped and what, what resonates quite a lot with people is um, that I, I developed a, a, you know, kind of it's a whole theory, it's a, it's a concept, but it's actually based in practice. Uh, and that is the, the what I call the aliveness approach. And, and that is so important to look at the systems that we would like to build and, and ask ourselves what gives lives to systems. If we understand that in small systems, we can also understand that and bring it into larger systems. And there is a very close relationship between what creates uh, aliveness in ourselves and um, what creates aliveness in the systems that we're operating in, in the processes, how we do transformation processes and in the, in the systems that we would like to achieve. I'm currently involved in a project with, with um, young professional women on creating a, a new economic architecture. And this is a hugely ambitious project where it's really about asking the questions uh, what be what would be a an economy in service of life in service of aliveness, so so that, that um, turned out to be uh, a quite inspiring way of looking at things, and this is so important because because the issue is, um, and I don't want to get in the wording of systems change or systems transformation because both I feel uncomfortable with because um, like 30 years ago systems change was about communism and capitalism. <laughs> And, and today, you know, it, it, it's a different connotation and systems change. I mean, we've been talking about this since the 80s. So uh, it, it has been in, in kind of many, many fora, you know, kind of uh, the, the, the focus. And it's clear that we have achieved a world in terms of how we operate with the planet, that we have to do much more conscious deliberate transform transformative processes. But what I find so exciting is, and that's, that's, that's a point that I would like to raise here is, uh, you know, our friend uh, Maya Goebel that, you know, some of you may, may uh, know, um, she says we actually need radical incremental transformation. And I love the combination of radical and incremental because the issue is if we look at the current situation and just flip side, um, the the way we perceive the world and at the moment we perceive the enormous pressure and this is justified the pressure that we really get into collective action change behavior do things different at scale uh, but we also know that the actual change of the system will take place on the local level so it's not going to be a top-down decision uh, you know it, it's going to be top-down bottom-up but both terms may not be the right terms you know it is happening everywhere. So what I find so interesting, if you just flip that and say, let's look at what is already happening and not what is not happening, because most people kind of uh, complain about what is not happening. But if you look at what is already happening, then uh, the question is slightly different. The question is, how can we connect what is already happening, which is, you know, kind of, you, uh, Barry, you mentioned this in kind of um, 
kind of convergence kind of initiatives. What is, how can we connect what is already happening? How can we amplify mindsets that are modeling the future? And these are all mindsets that have a, a completely different um, relationality with our role vis-a-vis -vis the planet, vis-a-vis -vis nature, vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, uh, Nori, you were talking about care. It, it's a, it, but, but it is already existing. There are so many, uh, I don't know, implementation, the, the, the projects, the initiatives, it, it's not just about global things, it's many local things. And there is a huge knowledge and wisdom, uh, not, not the least the, the indigenous wisdom that actually gives us the models of the future, and it, it sounds a little bit. I want to, uh, as if I want to go back to the past. No, but somehow, and I found a, a brilliant quote from somebody who's who, who was working on myth mythology. She says, "You know, the the future is emerging into the past. So it means that we need to pick up elements from the past in order to be able to go into a future." So, um, so the the issue really is about, and, and that's why why. The academy is also so important. It is really about more consciously bringing together what is already walking towards the right direction. And then, of course, we're not going to agree what exactly is the right direction and how exactly a new civilization is going to look like, because you know we 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 need to have inspiring narratives. That's why I I work best with aliveness narratives, but the the pathways need to be plural, because only if the pathways plural, they are plural, they can take place in South Africa and India and Philippines in a different way than in Finland and in Germany. And, and still, um, you know, if there is a responsibility towards the future and a responsibility towards our, our place on this planet in terms of place also in nature, uh, then a collaboration between the these different networks are important. So the issue about networks is indeed important, but not just networks that are narrowing around a certain identity and just exchanging, but networks in a in a really kind of um, mutually respectful, coordinated way. And so I believe that that increasingly. Terms like Earth stewardship, you know, like uh, the Anthropocene article took this up, Earth stewardship, or I call it collective stewardship, uh, are terms that are becoming more and more important because we cannot control the future and we cannot control the systems change. We cannot uh, walk with the old methodologies that cause the trouble <laughs> into the future. And yet we already have the future methodologies and some of them are ancient, some of them are very old. We need to kind of pick them up and uh, look at the Chinese philosophy, look at the Buddhist uh, philosophy, look at the Vedanta, look at, you know, I mean, and, and you can also look at the Celtic philosophy. I mean, like there, there, there are lots of different places or African philosophy. So it is about, um, it is indeed about collective stewardship. And I like the term stewardship because because it means that the future is somehow entrusted to us. We cannot determine the future. We cannot, uh, we cannot control it. Uh, we need to walk with a high degree of humility, humility and a high degree of mutual respect. But at the same time, we need to be more active, more conscious about human agency. And what is, even the important, and that is something that we shouldn't forget. If you look at successful transformation networks, and uh, no matter if they are uh, sustainable coffee uh, value chains or uh, getting gay marriages into laws, uh, every, every protected transformative process somehow needs to materialize in structure, in institutions. Yeah. So it is absolutely important that we think about not maybe now, <laughs> not immediately, but, but, but not forget that it's not just about dialogue and thinking differently and being nice with each other, but really saying, um, how does this need to materialize in, in already existing systems because laws are existing systems, but how can they, how can the future be anchored in systems that we have, in institutions that we have, or institutions that we need to create. So that would be my contribution. That's beautiful, Petra. Thank you so much for, 
for sharing those thoughts. A lot of really, really great ideas there. And I'm, I'm very inspired by your aliveness narrative. Um, I've done a lot of work with narrative. And I think also has Nadine, who I'm going to introduce um, next. I, I love your idea of making an economics that work for life, right? And absolutely, we need to, we're in this process of, of, of systems change. We're, we're in it. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned is that the fact that, yeah, it's top down, but it's also bottom up. This local, the local action will also be a big player in br us coming together for changing our systems. Um, and um, Nadine Block has a lot of experience in working um, with local activists and social movements, um, in particular with arts-based methods, which they have a toolkit of, I don't even wanna say how many case studies, tactics, principles, uh, strategies that they've put together, um, but it's a phenomenal voice of, of human agency. And also for me, um, we have to acknowledge the amount of suffering that's been caused by systemic violence. And although, you know, activists, I, I take Nora's point, it does go up and down in terms of what you get. But at the same time, that chaos, I think, is coming from um, the violence that has been imposed on, on populations, the oppression, the, the inequality of socioeconomic inequality, things like that. And I find art an amazing language for dealing with all of those things. Um, so I, so I, I think the role of the arts in cultural change, local change, is very important. And with that, I will, I will pass it over to Nadine. Oh, thank you, Julian. Thanks, uh, Petra, Barry, Nora, Frank, everyone for speaking. Um, uh, I'll, I'll do a mini introduction and then say a few words. And uh, I love the back and forth. So my name is Nadine Block. I am a practitioner, an artist, an activist, a strategist uh, in people-powered social movements. I am also the training director for Beautiful Trouble. Uh, we are a group who we say that is dedicated to making revolution irresistible. Uh, thank you, Tony Cade Bambara for that uh, framing. And um, just to, to speak a little bit more and our website is beautifultrouble.org. Uh, for folks who want to look at it, available in, in many like in about five languages at the moment. Um, and what we do is we do start with storytelling. So our intersection with system change, if you will, and the way I use the term system change is really um, I'm thinking right now about these exploitative systems that we need to transform. And that's the word that we use, transform, not change within the system, but to try to think outside of the systems that we're all embedded in, which in and of itself, as we have mentioned, is quite difficult. We have to create in the moment, embedded in these, these exploitative systems, a new way or an old way, right? Reintegrating old ways is fine, or a new way that's looking, that integrates old ways and moves towards the future of right relationship with each other. And um, actually to start that off, I also wanted to say I'm calling in from outside of Washington, DC. This is the land of the Piscataway or the Nakachank originally. And I just wanna acknowledge the land that I'm calling in from and acknowledge who's on this call as well um, and who's not on the call so that we're having this conversation. One of the things that Beautiful Trouble does uh, to get back to it is that we have a pattern language approach to social change, right? And we seek to help social movements document and then uh, generalize or articulate and then apply their insights and their breakthroughs in ways that they can learn from and that others can learn from and that they can experiment when, with in their own context. And this means, and this, the reason why we're there is because we understand this power of arts and storytelling and culture to engage people, not just in their hearts, but in their bodies, in their guts, to really connect on a level that will motivate them to take action. And I think um, this was mentioned that all of this talk really uh, comes down to what is the concrete manifestation in already existing uh, systems or ways that we're living that will enable us to then build towards a future that is healthier, more peaceful, more sustainable, um, in fact, uh, more of a place where each person feels their own agency and ability to take action and cr 
craft the future that will serve them. And um, that's the essential place that arts and culture or the essential role that arts and culture plays in communicating that everyone has a place in this work, that the stories and the histories and the ancestors who we stand on and all of the learnings that we have brought with us to this moment are going to be critical in mobilizing and energizing people to be actively engaged, to embrace their agency. And um, I think, uh, I'm also a, not only a scientist, uh, an artist, but I was trained as a scientist um, in the early days of my, in my undergraduate work. I actually uh, contributed to the research done on the nuclear winter theory that was promoted by Carl Sagan and others. And folks may remember that was a great moment thinking about ecosystem services as we framed it, right? What, how the, the potential explosions of a nuclear a uh, bomb would actually obliterate the ability of phytoplankton plants in the ocean to re to then create oxygen. And that whole picture of how we're all integrated um, and basically uh, at you know part of this ecosystem, as we're all talking about, that we rely on for life, um, I think uh, is really critical to our understanding of how we are all connected to each other as individuals as well. And um, I know uh, this radical incremental transformation is a concept that we build on because we understand that change does happen at a local level, you know, the, I think, and that it can filter up and across as well as uh, um, in many other directions. And we can learn a lot from the ecosystem and the networks that the fungi uh, uh, engage in, for example, in their work in providing us with what we need to live here on this planet. And so as artists and as cultural workers, there is not one size fits all. And I think this is another really important thing. The old way or the, the past capitalistic system way of thinking is that there, the bigger the grid, the one way we deliver energy, the one solution, the mass production of whether it's clothing or food or any of these things is the way to go. And what we find when we look at solutionary work um, and we engage in arts and culture is that in fact, the solutions are as individualistic as the people who are engaged. So we know um, that the arts and culture can contribute to the emotional, the psychological, the, uh, the real uh, commitment of folks to take action. We know from studying change in our systems towards democratic principles and activities and governments, that people powered movements, nonviolent movements are twice as effective as those that rely on violence. And the reason that is essentially is because of numbers. Movements that embrace creative resistance are open to more people. They're more accessible. There's a lower bar to entry. You don't have to be young and willing to pick up a weapon to engage in it. You have to be able to bring your full self and your arts, your culture, your communication styles, your dialogue potential, all of this with you and have a variety of ways of engaging people and moving them to take action. So um, I think uh, there's a lot to learn uh, from this, from studying our stories of change and engagement. Um, and that's where we start as Beautiful Trouble. And then we try to make these principles, theories, tactics more accessible so that we can have more effective people powered movements across the board to make change at global, local, community, state, national levels to work towards this bigger vision, this multiplicity of bigger visions that include healthier uh, future for people and the planet. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, so many great ideas. I, I love the idea of empowering people to feel they can contribute to system change because I, I suspect for many people, it seems overwhelming. What can I do to change the economic and political system? And then I also thought the idea that art and culture, a purpose of that is to show us that, that everyone has a, a role to play in system change. Beautiful ideas. Um, Next on our panel, and I'm, I apologize in advance if I pronounce your name incorrectly, is it Joa? Joao, is it Joao? Yeah. Yes. Joao, uh, okay. Don't worry, I, I'm, used, I, I'm used to, to, to several pronunciations. And, uh, you know, Sorry. in the end, <laughs> uh, it's, always, it's always me. I haven't changed yet. <laughs> so, no, I don't worry. Um, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Well, change 
transformation, those are very big words, uh, juggernaut words, in fact. They, they have several, several, many, many meanings. Uh, I'm a physicist by training, so I, I take a, a, a scientist's view of change uh, to say, and especially this notion of systems change, um, especially because we are at the moment, in a moment, uh, we, in the moment, in this moment, we are uh, undergoing a tremendous change uh, between ourselves. Uh, I mean, in our way of communicating, uh, close contact, close physical physical contact, I, I mean, uh, is has become a sin. Uh, and uh, we are not used to it. Well, it has happened before in history, you know, but uh, I'm sure that every time it happened, uh, it was really, um, you know, a very troublesome epoch uh, that um, um, provoked lots of, uh, of uh, change, transformation. Um, so um, evolution is another way, another word that we can put in here. Uh, and here is what is, what, is, uh, what is systems change. Well, systems are made of uh, nodes and connections. Sometimes there are nodules in, in the middle of that. Uh, like network, networks, well, they, they respond to institutions. But one thing about systems is that they work for a purpose, and especially living systems, they work for a purpose. And we can say that um, uh, from a very simple way, that change, what it means, change is adaptation. Adaptation. Uh, we all know that uh, there are adaptations that uh, do not work at all, adaptations who are successful, uh, adaptations that are very strenuous, other ones that are almost insignificant, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't make any difference at all. So uh, we, we in society and in ourselves, we, we have witnessed and we are um, in, 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 in the, in the in the mood of, uh, you know, uh, not knowing uh, if uh, we are changing uh, uh, in in terms of uh, of if you have to change uh, our societies in in what direction, but that is common. Uh, uh, the notion here of uh, uh, going into the future, uh, uh, we know that in fact. Uh, uh, the game, the game of evolution, is is uh, adaptation, uh, and uh, futurologists say that uh, the best way to uh, to adapt to to uh, to change is to invent the future, and so <laughs> you can go into it, but that connects already with with culture. So we can have many ways of changing, and I will cut it short. Uh, we, we can have a change in the purpose of the system that we are um, looking at. That's a sort of a, 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 com a composite um, um, a global change. We can have change in the nodes. We can change, have change in the links. And uh, we also can have change from the exterior of the system, whatever it is. So we have change from inside and change from the outside. And uh, so this means that any system, uh, especially any living system, uh, is always uh, uh, in, in an environment where there are other living systems. And all of them want to, in fact, keep going because that's uh, what life is about. And we are not different from the other ones. Uh, and this is this, uh, uh, this uh, continuous, uh, uh, um, well, fight or drive for survival that is the main engine of change. Of course, in situations where uh, we probably thought that change was, um, outside change was very small and uh, 
population, in fact, uh, uh, was was slow, slow, changing slowly. Uh, well, this didn't uh, have any any big significance uh, at all. But nowadays, uh, we just feel it very, 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 very strongly. So, I would leave it. I would leave it here uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, um, um, living uh, of saying that uh, we uh, are in fact uh, um, no more than everything else living on earth. Well, we have some difference. We have a <laughs> very powerful mini, mi <laughs> means of communication. That was in fact one of the uh, eight, uh, the last, uh, uh, the latest stage in, in, in evolution of, of living beings. Uh, as the biologists uh, say, yeah. Yeah. evolutionary biologists. So, well, we have to use this fantastic means of communication to keep, in fact, our uh, capacity of, of living on our planet and maybe elsewhere um, uh, correctly. Uh, we cannot let this system sort of get out of uh, the rails. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, I wanted to take a shot at, since I'm a panelist too, at the question of what is system change and how can we achieve it? And I'd like to focus on the content side. I've been, uh, there's a lot of great work on how do we bring people together and get them to work together on the process of system change. But as I, I also take more of a scientific view, like you just said, uh, Joel, and think, well, what is it exactly that we have to change? What does it look like? And because if we can get a roadmap of the changes that are needed to get to sustainable society, then that will facilitate a lot of the process work. We'll have something to focus on. And one way to do that um, is with the uh, laws of nature. The laws of nature um, define what have controlled whether or not species survive and prosper on this planet, planet for 3.5 billion years. And that is 100% what will determine whether or not we, we stay or go. And so the, these laws provide, uh, we can have a, develop a very clear vision of what sustainable society is going to look like. We know what's gonna happen on this planet. The only question is, gonna, is, our, is are we gonna be here? And the answer to that is that if we abide by the laws of nature, then yes, we will be here. So what, are, so what are those laws? There's many of them. They're really conditions for sustainable systems at, at all different levels. There are some that we're all familiar with like the circular economy principles, uh, limiting growth, producing no waste, living off of renewable resources, but also implied operating principles of, of nature are equitable resource distribution, cooperation, equally valuing current and future generations, equally valuing species, decentralizing governance and production, enabling individuals to reach their fullest potential. Also implied operating principles of sustainable systems include democracy, full cost accounting, producing no externalities, equality, and full employment. Now, all of these things are wonderful moral ideas or philosophical ideas. But the problem with morality and philosophy is that you can get into endless debates. And that's one way that Besson and Chris tie things up. These principles are also objective reality. It doesn't matter. Nature doesn't care what humans think, say, or do. We'll either abide by its laws or we won't. If we don't like these principles, it doesn't matter. These are the facts of nature. So with that equitable resource distribution, for example, or cooperation, some might have a philosophical view on that, but within the overwhelming force in nature is cooperation, not competition. Resources are distributed equitably. Um, the SDGs, for example, provide a human-centric view of sustainability. They're a wonderful achievement, but the reality-based view for human sustainability is the laws of nature, not the SDGs. Abiding by them is the, 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 the only way probably to achieve the SDGs. So there's the principle of putting the what before the how. Uh, before we talk about how to change something, it's important to identify what is the change that we want. Once that's clear, then we can, uh, then we can figure out how to achieve it. So when we, it, 
we can define what many aspects of sustainable society will look like. Once that's clear, that shows what are the systemic changes needed to get from here to there. I can't cover all of them, but I've written a lot about them in my books, Global System Change. But just to give three principles of system change, one is to emulate nature. Virtually all of the economic and political system changes that we need to make are implied or shown in nature. Another one is democracy. That's the only sustainable form of government because it's based on the innate equality and right to self-government of everyone. And prop, maybe the most important principle, especially in the corporate and financial area for system change is the rule of law. I spent many years looking at how companies were compelled to degrade the environment and society. There are many economic and political system flaws that force them to degrade life support systems and hurt different stakeholders, uh, such as limited liability, time value of money, externalities, focusing on economic growth instead of social well being, and many others. If you were to take all of the system flaws and roll them up into one overarching system flaw, it would be the failure to hold companies fully responsible for negative impacts. In competitive markets, this is what creates the mechanism where companies cannot mitigate and remain in business. If they try to voluntarily stop harming life support systems or stakeholders, they can make more money up to a certain point, but beyond a certain point, their costs go up and they die. So our, situation, our si systems unintentionally create a situation where companies must degrade life support systems and society to survive. Nobody intended that. It's the result of reductionism. The rule of law says, do whatever you want, but don't hurt anyone else. Our systems mm -hmm. not only allow companies to harm the environment and society, they compel it. So um, that's, that's why the rule of law essentially is non-debatable within the realm of logic. Companies can't argue that they should be allowed to harm the environment and society. It's a way to frame up system change that every, everyone can understand. Once you get down into the details of it, it's difficult, um, becomes very complex. Okay, so there, if I was laying out a roadmap for humanity to sustainability, the first one, there'd be three parts. For, well. There's many more, but three high level parts. One is what does sustainable society look like? Two, what are the system changes needed to get there? And three, what are the actions in all areas of society needed to bring about these changes? We need areas in government, action in government, the general public and the corporate and financial. Government, the main change obviously is hold companies responsible. That way they make the most money by acting responsibly. But government largely is controlled by business so we need business and the general public to push government to change. The people are the most powerful force in society collectively. They, if they work together, they could change any business or government, but it's easy to divide them and disempower them with deceptive media and other things. So in the US, we've got the conservative versus liberal civil war that's led to the insanity we're seeing here and uh, made us unable to work together on our common interests. A main solution there as was discussed in another panel on this conference is require honest media. If Fox News shows uh, Exxon scientists that says climate change isn't real, the, the fairness doctrine, which we got rid of in 87, would have said, now you have to show a scientist that explains why it is real. But half the country doesn't he only hears from the Exxon scientist or the oil company scientists. Um, and they come to think that climate change is a, a scam to hurt the economy or something. And then we need action in the corporate and financial sector. Probably the single most important thing we could do to drive system change there is to use investing uh, to engage companies in system change. We have successfully used responsible investing for 20 years to compel companies to implement sustainability strategies. We can use the exact same approach to get them to implement, uh, engage in collaborative system change. Okay, so just a couple of final points. Uh, in terms of putting the, the what before the how, um, one way to think of it is first identify the changes that we need. And then the next step is to figure out what are the processes and communication strategies to achieve that. So for example, looking at nature, we know that in sustainable society, there won't be any limited liability, externalities or time value of money. But if we go out and say to business and uh, finance leaders who've been making money on these for their whole careers and say, yeah, we wanna get rid of those things, that would not be an effective strategy. That's not gonna facilitate voluntary system change. 
So just like if 200 years ago, if we went in the Southern US, went and said, we need to get rid of slavery, that wouldn't have been the best way to approach it. Um, so we have to help them understand the business case for system change, help them to see how these systems are harming you and improving, improving them can benefit you. So one final point, there's no one correct way to do system change. We see here on this panel, there's many different wonderful ideas. They're all needed. There's no one right way. I think we need uh, more work at the higher level. We talk about the community and the local level, but uh, especially at the national level, economic and political systems severely constrain organizational and community system change efforts. So we do have to make, that's where the system flaws that I discussed are largely controlled at the national level. Companies can, who already engage with government can begin to engage in a different way and encourage them to basically simple answer, hold us more responsible, then we make more money by acting more responsibly. So anyway, I, I love this rich panel. It's great to be a part of it. Um, the, we, we had a series of questions that we were going to work through. We don't have to completely stick with them. I hope at the end we wind up with maybe an idea of how we could coalesce all this into a recommendation for loss around system change. But if moving through the questions and the, the next one, uh, and Nadine already touched on this, is what is the role of culture and art and system change? And then here people can just use the raise hand function if they'd like to contribute. Or if you'd like to take the, the discussion in another direction, feel free to do so. And I might get in trouble for that, but go ahead anyway. Nora? Yeah, I wanted to um, pick up on something that came up earlier, but it actually ties together. So that works really well. Um, because um, you were speaking about how living systems are within living systems and that life is continuing. And, um, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think this is a, a there's a depth that often gets missed in this piece of, of looking at the way that this uh, biological continuing is actually, uh, it, it is systems change, always. Of course it is, it has to be. Um, because what's really deadly is systems not change. <laughs> Whatever that would be. Obsolescence is, is, is lying that way. Um, and, and just to kind of bring into that and, and articulate it um, a little further and attach it into that, the art question. Um, you know, if you think about the ways in which a meadow is meadowing, right? Um, there are all these organisms that are you could identify and study them as separate organisms. But what is really interesting is when you start to see the way in which these organisms are multiply providing vitality for each other, not in one way, in multiple ways. Um, so the earthworm is, is earthworming along and it's, it's eating in the soil and it's pooping in the soil and it's producing the soil and it's aerating the soil. And in that sense, it's, it's creating the possibility for trees and plant life and other um, microbial life to, to, to exist. And it's also food for the birds and its proteins and its enzymes. And it's also what we take fishing and it's also, right? So there's all these multiple ways in an ecology in which things get knitted together. And what's important about this in, in the question of systems change is the way in which these multiple knittings can shift because they already are shifting. Right? In order for a meadow to stay stable, stable, it has to keep changing. Um, so then there's this other piece there, which is that there's you and me, and we're sitting in that meadow. And we have an appreciation of the beauty of that meadow. We have poetry about that meadow. We have notions of love and spring. We have symbolism. We have all kinds of stuff that also knit our existence 
in an, a, an emotional, imaginational, cultural, linguistic way into that meadow. Um, and this is where we often get lost. Uh, and one of the examples of this that is, is uh, I think most, it's sort of low hanging fruit and, and maybe you could criticize it, but there was a moment when, when in the sort of peak popularity of the SDGs, um, President Macron tried to make a gas tax in keeping with that. Um, and what, what was missing there because the, the attempt to, to fold into a kind of new set of policies and structures and abide by coming into a new world and use the old world to create the new world. But there was a depth of personal experience, of culture, of language. There was a whole lot of transcontextual processes and they got triggered and they started to trigger. So one of the things that I think is most interesting is the question of, of how to think about all of the issues in, in a changing system and what, what we are doing, even talking about it. And, and can we begin to not only perceive, but also tend to these issues, not only in the first order, but in second, third, fourth order relational processes. So the, the temptation is to perceive the issue, to analyze the issue and to start to create structure and maybe bring in other aspects of the system and try to knit them in, in a managerial function, but not to recognize how that set of relational process then taints and changes the next set of relational processes, the meta messages, the ways in which um, the ways in which, I mean, frankly, we have a situation right now where at a political level, discussions of systems change and response to environmental climate have become highly polarized and politicized yeah. even within our own families. So how to, um, you know, recognize that whatever it is we're talking about, it's not just about going out there and making change. It's also about tending to the ways in which all kinds of internal processes are knitted in. And to me, this comes back to art. Um, it comes back to art because art is, well, here's the thing. My grandfather, William, um, he, he actually, he coined the term genetics, right? And in 1888, he gave a description of systems and systems change. I'll put it in the chat in a minute that is gonna blow your mind. And it starts off by him saying, my, my brain is boiling with evolution. And what's happened is that he's recognized that in order for any organism to change, it has to change in relationship to the others. And he's really asking like, what is change? And he used to say this thing, and he would say that- Just watch time as well, so if you can just- okay, yeah. sorry. It's a cute story, and then I'll, I'll just, but, but that, that genius could only ever be seen in art and in nature. And that science should always be inspired by it, but it would never achieve it. And, and this is because of those multiplicitous ways in which these always responding processes are in relationship. And the only way that relationship can continue is if they change. So art, I mean, in, in a way, what I think we're looking at is actually uh, a, a really desperate need for entirely new genres of art, where we can start to express experiences of being human that, we've, that have never been expressed before. Yeah. Um, knit us into the ecology. There we go. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to put some, a couple things in, sum up, and I know we got to go to questions and things as well. Um, one of the things that we looked at in systemic engagement of the arts is understanding arts as a social knowledge system. 
being able to read what is embodied and embedded in the larger social order. Okay, and um, by understanding the arts in this way, you can you can see understand most deeply the history, the experience, the levels, the relationships, the interrelationships of a country by the history of their dramaturgy, by the history of the music, because you can review it in these interfaceted relationship ways. Um, and I'm just going to keep it to on the level of interrelationships. One of the things we put forward for bringing forward all systems change efforts. Life is lifing. Transformation is happening. At the same time, like Frank Dixon said, you know, I, nature doesn't. Nature's going to carry on doing what's doing. The question is, are we going to be here? And my concern is, are we gonna shift the paradigm before it crashes? And one of the ways we have to address dysfunctions, but one of the ways is also this deeper level of what you're talking about of interrelationships and how can we create um, more collective intelligence and inter-awareness, self-illuminating system of inter-awareness because my interest is not to say there's one systems change method and that life is lifing and meadows are meadowing but at the same time i think this is about what can we put forward as a conscious effort you know with with barry's work petra's work all the the um, local grassroots work, work that nadine is doing can we come out of, well, we're, we're not reductionist thinkers, clearly, um, but what could we do collectively and powerfully to think about better aligning social and natural systems? I'm just gonna hand it over to panel questions or, yeah. Well, I, I, I'll just make a, a quick point on that. And that is that, um, you know, nature is coordinated by the, the wisdom of nature. There's nobody whispering in a grasshopper's ear saying, take only what you want, but somehow through instinct or DNA or things we don't understand, nature produces essentially infinite cooperation in our bodies. We're nature too. We have the capacity to, to produce the same high level of cooperation, sophistication, technology already present in nature. And that comes through the intuitive. We're not, we're not taught how to, how to use it. So that's a, that's a key part of it. Um, you know, a, a key issue with sustainability uh, is balancing power and wisdom. We have an abundance of power in the world, but not enough wisdom to use it correctly. We're destroying ourselves unintentionally. It's no coincidence, I think, that men are above women, because you know men innately manifest greater physical strength, more aggressiveness. Women innately manifest, on average, more wisdom, more empathy, more cooperation. Those are the skills that we need to save the planet, but in a competitive, fear-filled world, they're not valued as highly as aggressiveness and competition. So how do we teach, as we teach boys and girls, men and women, the intuitive wisdom, cooperation, empathy, relationship skills, that'll, as we elevate wisdom, it'll naturally elevate women. And what one key thing about art, Carl Jung pointed out that um, art uh, the, through the intuitive, the art often is a leading indicator of what's going to happen in society. You could look at before World War I and World War II, you could see some of the chaos showing up in the art in the 1920s. Um, so, you know, what is art telling us now about what's, what's going to be happening in the future? Maybe that's our crystal ball in some ways. Yeah. I'm just wondering if Nadine wants to pop in with anything about the role of art in this systems change. I definitely want to pop in for a minute. Um, and in particular, uh, broadening the term, I often call, I'm an artist, right? An activist artist. That's also one of the hats I wear besides being just so committed to training and the power of training and education in the work that we do in mobilizing folks and helping people understand their own agency. Um, and having said that, I don't often say I'm an artist. I, I would rather say I'm a cultural worker or I engage people. I, I'm a way to talk to people about facilitation or engagement and reclaiming agency. And because, you know, in the end, what we're talking about is that if we can't learn to play nicely with each other, uh, we're not going to be around and perhaps we shouldn't be around if we can't 
learn to play nicely with each other. And so it's about how we work together and um, how we communicate, how we learn to dialogue versus debate. And in the, in the end, how we facilitate or show up in spaces and we understand the now we use the term inter intersectionality of oppressions or the interconnectedness of the world that we inhabit. Um, and so even as we you know, build the plane, as we fly it, or as the Zapatistas say, you know, we walk forward together questioning or questioning we walk, um, how do we, uh, it, it is really critical to have that full expanse of arts and culture and to think about everything that we do more as an art rather than a science, because there are many answers and the answers need to come from the communities and the culture that are actually engaged in the train change or the, or the movement towards a better vision on the front lines. And so Beautiful Trouble is an international network, a global collection of trainers and artists and activists and cultural workers who are really dedicated to helping people understand uh, what has happened and where people can go and how they can much more effectively uh, mobilize and make change on all of these multiplicity of levels. And that uh, cultural element is critical to avoiding crises like you mentioned uh, of Macron and um, uh, all kinds of other um, reinforcement or replication of the ways that we interact that are so harmful and are ex based in an exploitative corporate uh, structure, corporate capitalist structure that is actually ex trying to externalize costs. And so the culture can really help us reclaim this work and what it means to us in our daily lives and mobilize people to take action. And therefore will hopefully help us get to actual, you know, uh, manifestations of laws and regulations and ways of change. I don't think uh, we can leave this uh, most at this moment to um, voluntary, uh, uh, voluntary work on the part of corporations that are dedicated to uh, prioritizing the bottom line over people. So yes. I'll stop there. Beautiful, thank you, Nadine. It's an interesting space between what you can catalyze with arts, but also what can you, you can watch as emergent knowledge and uh, you know the kinds of things that Nora Bates was talking about. But, um, yeah, we've got we've got two hands up. So I'll start with Petra. And if we can, I mean, I would like us to say, how can we, with all the different approaches and, and things like that, um, what can we do to really bring forward something powerful? I know Petra's done a lot of very practical work. So um, I'll take your hands up question and then maybe you can also lead on or lead the way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, just uh, maybe a, uh, a word on, on arts, because I, I agree um, with, with Nadine that it, or, you know, I, th I think Julian, you were also saying this, uh, arts and culture are often modeling already the future. You know, they're like, like the spots into the future. Not only, of course, you know, there's lots of arts that actually is a, a way of healing the past. Uh, and, and of course, there, there are many more spaces in, in, in arts and culture. But I think what is, what is very important if we think about uh, more deliberate transformative processes that we um, reconnect, <laughs> interesting enough <laughs> that I'm saying this here in this panel, arts and science. <laughs> so, uh, and, and because they actually belong together, but they have been uh, severely disconnected, you know, also kind of, uh, up to the point um, that that arts don't doesn't think that science is relevant, and science certainly doesn't think that arts are relevant. Yeah, so I'm ex exaggerating a little bit, but but that's how you know how it turns out, and um, and that is so important. And that's another uh, little thing where I think uh, it's 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 so interesting to observe how uh, the the transformations that lie in front of us so I need to get hold of some aspects of the past because if you if you go a couple of centuries back then arts and science were always like closely connected yeah, so so the the intuitive and the rational uh, wasn't completely disconnected as it is today yeah? and I do think what can what uh, what we can learn from that and I mean I'm not saying this is an, an, an easy uh, decision to make but but in, in transformative processes not just kind of saying we have a nice conference and then we get a singer in or kind of a visual artist or whatever but uh, but, but really uh, making it much more of an, of an integration and and making making sure that 
that the spaces for the creativity that arts bring in is really nurtured and is is connected to the to the space that we create for for the the hardcore rational science and so i do think we can become more creative in in not adding arts to something else but but really having an integrated process. I think it's very fascinating if you look at uh, futurists in, in Africa, you know, of course they're not known, you know, most of them are not known, but, but these are huge cultures and subcultures where, where things are happening that, that we, we don't have a clue what is happening, but they are somehow living parts of the future that may be so extremely important for us. So, so my plea would be uh, to go beyond um, also, in, in, in the way we talk about uh, transformation science, in the way we, we talk about um, yeah, kind of working towards systems transformation, that we, that we actually uh, reconnect with arts in, in a more generic way and not just in picking that, you know, kind of in showing something or, you know, having nice pictures around, you know, Absolutely. It's really a more intrinsic connection, acknowledging that this is a way of, um, of uh, you know, whatever, cultivating the, 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 the presence, um, uh, rehabilitating the past and also living the future that, that we need for our transformation processes. And I don't know if you want to move in what we could do collectively. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, I do think what I, what I find interesting here, and maybe maybe there's a, really a step in, in I don't know, Frank, what, what, what your uh, purpose was to, to also kind of go from here, yeah? But I do think it would be quite interesting to see, uh, number one, which, um, which transformative approaches seem to uh, stick with people and, and, um, and work, yeah? And, and learn from the experience without getting in competition, you know? I don't want to kind of be, competing with my aliveness approach, you know, with somebody else. Yeah, so it, th that is not necessary, but it would be interesting to, to see uh, also more, more on a generic level, you know, what, 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 uh, what creates resonance? Because we do have, I, I noticed we do have, I don't know what it is now, uh, we do have a, a, a question in, in, the, in the question and answers on, on collective behavior change. And I do think collective behavior change, number one, it requires a, a combination of science and arts and not one or the other. And, and number two, uh, the, the, the question is, how can we, I, I'm, Frank, I'm, I'm not going with laws because laws are for me um, a little bit too far. And, and I would also say the laws of nature, we don't know yet. We don't know enough. There are so many things in nature and I just look at the communication of trees that we haven't been aware of, uh, you know, kind of uh, since recently. And uh, so I wouldn't say laws, but, but are, there, are there generic insights that we can draw out uh, together that, that uh, are built on our practice, that are built on our uh, maybe conceptual approaches, but, but in a combination of conceptual approaches and practice uh, that, that can be drawn out as as I said, you know, I'm not not for five steps to heaven or kind of three laws or whatever, but but uh, generic insights that help us uh, to to look at and and how to help people to become more aware of you know what would work in terms of collective behavior change, what would work in terms of um, looking at the world in a different way because the mindset shift, um, Julian, you started with that. You know, it's so extremely important. The way we look at the world is, uh, or the way the way we need to resurface how people look at the world because many more people look differently at the world than what is mainstream looking at the world. So, yes. uh, so, and uh, maybe that's a work we can do together. A lot of really good points. Thank you, Petra, for, for sharing. And I think what you one of the couple of things that you said were really key, right? It's like if you understand, for example, arts as a social knowledge system, right? Um, re, you know all the interrelationships that Nora was talking about. Then what we're then we have to be careful about how we engage it. We're, what kind of participation, you know, not just having a performance on the side, that's not transformative. And actually, um, Center for Arts Based Activism talk about this, that the creative process is baked in. It's not just something you do on the side. 
for a transformation process to take place, especially artistically based, the creative process is baked in from the very beginning and and it and it'll come out in the in the types of activities engaged, in the way the social structure is engaged. Um, so I just want to tie together because I know we're coming short on time. Um, how we can move with the movements of nature that you know Nora's talking about, how we can engage those inter-reflections, multi-dimensional reflections, but how we can also, I just pulled up your uh, website on to, together we build a new economic architecture. And the word, when I read the word architecture, that symbol came up. And I think nature is an architecture. We have a lot to learn about that. But I think what we do know and have enough knowledge on is the current architecture is definitely not sustainable. What the new one is, is going to be a process. And we can use artistic and cultural means definitely as a key way to engage the transformative elements. But what if, what if the, the arts and the culture and the us, our mindsets, our behavior, what if we are the art and the institutions we have created are in fact our, our science, uh, like in, in a sense, just think of institutional mechanics as the science, the collective way that we've organized ourselves. How can we move these two together? The art of us and the sort of structures that we've created and I think it is about that key relationship, that key relationship on how we start reinstitutionalizing, remodeling, but identifying that that's not gonna happen unless we move with nature in those natural motions that Nora was saying, and unless we create new narratives and new mindsets, Barry just sent a, a text on that. And in fact, one of the things that I've seen with the STGs is, and all these great efforts is, a, a, a lack of a process for co-creative narratives, and in fact, a lack of a, a, of a compelling narrative altogether with a momentous movement like the SDGs. And what's the compelling narrative? You know, you know, and how is that co-created? And what does that participation look like? And in fact, is that partic participation transformative or not? I'm asking these questions because there is a profound depth and beauty with moving with nature, absolutely. Um, but I think a lot of those are being blocked in unhealthy ways. And we don't need to talk about all the environmental science and things like that. But how can we come together, right, for a new architecture, economic architecture, social architecture, as well as engage all this be more beautiful depth, because it's infinite, isn't it, right, with nature and and create this, this transformative process that we all clearly have a piece of. We have a piece of it. And how can we sort of come together to do something quite powerful for what is a very uncertain future of this planet? Um, and so I wanna hand it out. What maybe we can just <laughs> respond, respond to some of those and see what can we do together in a more collectively intelligent way to take some systemic processes and systemic action. Joe has had his hand up. Would you like to go, Joe? You're muted. You want to unmute yourself. Your, your mute is on. Joey, you're you're uh, you're muted. We can't. I know, hear I know, you. I know. I was I was <laughs> fighting against the machine. You know, it says, uh, um, "Well, this is also part of nature." The machines, you know, uh, not living nature, but um, uh, not living nature. And um, the thing is, we are also part of nature. So when we think we have to go with nature, uh, we have to go with ourselves as well. Uh, and that's a very difficult, uh, a very difficult thing. But when, when we are born, when suppose 10, 10 little um, babies are born uh, and they grow up at the beginning, they are all the same. They have, uh, they experience very similar things. They suppose they live in the same village. 
but then when as long as they grow up they specialize somehow maybe one or two or three will become artists and uh, maybe one or two or three will become scientists so what i'm trying to say is that in fact the notion of art and the notion of science are abstract notions um what exists really is um, is um artists and scientists and other all the other um, capacities that that we 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 develop and uh, the difficulty with uh, with uh, some of these um, uh, uh, activities we have is that for for being able to express to feel and to express uh, our 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 ways of 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 looking to the outside to society to nature to to the universe um we developed we have to develop very sophisticated languages very sophisticated languages visual uh, oral uh, uh, um, written languages that in fact only the specialists of the field can really handle and that uh, gives way a little bit to some incomprehension that goes on uh, between uh, uh, many groups of, of people you see i was fascinated to see for instance that um, you know when we in this panel talk about nature we are all um, in the same in the same line of understanding that we are part of nature and uh, we are uh, a species we are all the same we are different you know different characteristics but we are all equal and so on and this is a notion that was brought by science and quite recently in fact in uh, in evolutive terms i mean uh, um, decades ago uh, it, this was not common uh, people thought otherwise so in fact these notions have to circulate and have we have to communicate this and we have to evolve a vision that really goes on and encompasses all all these all, all these views it's very difficult you know uh, in my life i i have watched by by, by, by the need of my profession i <laughs> i i hold held and then watch many many meetings of of um, between art and science and sometimes art being made by by scientists and science or scientific uh, uh, depictions or art, uh, artifacts being made by artists and so on and we've got, we've got only... about uh, 10 15 minutes so i want to make sure if you want to just round up because i, I want to make sure we uh, cover everything yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was just yeah i'm, I'm, I'm just take one minute uh, to say that uh, uh, the difficulty is that uh, for scientists what artists do in science look like technology it's not really science you see it's not sufficiently abstract and for artists you know the the kind of art that scientists do it's like illustration you know well it's not really art and, and so on so there is a big uh, need to open up and evolve in terms of uh, language communication and uh, uh, an extension and uh, and I'll, I'll stay here uh, culture is the overarching word which is in the title of our of our panel culture is the overarching word that uh, has to do with systemic change because culture encompasses everything all these uh, uh, ideas all these notions go into culture and we have to develop a vision that is in accordance with the views in these several uh, disciplines, uh, uh, savoir, as the French say, uh, that will allow us to survive. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I hate cutting you off because you're so you're so lovely. So I I really don't like to cut you off. But I think there's nothing some else to say. <laughs> Uh, there's some good points there, right, on art science relationship and on working with culture, because in fact, you know, uh, culture is language, it's symbols, and a, a lot of institutions or, or, you know, initiatives, sorry, initiative, initiatives that I've seen for structural change 
um, they fall down in dealing with mentality, right? In the implementation of dealing with diverse mentalities. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, and on that note, um, Barry put, uh, Barry Gills put a great thing in the chat. Um, um, it's about creating sort of a future form of new narratives, processes, institutions, mentalities, practices. And I think if we really go into that, um, if we really go into that, you know, we're talking both art science at a very deep level. Art in terms of the processes that Nora Bateson was talking about, um, practices, local, global, institutions, right? Incredible, like what she's, what uh, uh, Petra's talking about with a new um, um, economic architecture, right? In fact, um, just in the work that I've done, essentially a lot of activism could be much more structural. That activism is not no longer just about NGOs, it's about really game-changing innovations that are creating new models, new uh, modus operandi, um, um, but also working with that, all the emergent life systems that Nor Bateson's talking about. So I just wanna throw this out here because I know we, we don't have much time left. That is this, um, group on identifying transformations in narratives, processes, institutions, mentalities, practices. Maybe we can showcase some good examples, come up with best practices, identify, you know, warm data, interrelationships. Um, you know, is that it, it just throwing this out there as a possible because I know the, the one of the objectives for for Gary and was was can we make this a working group? Um, um, and what what are just throwing that out there as a concept for a working group, you know, to to build a potential project? How do how does everybody feel about that? <laughs> All these brilliant people. I want to hear what you think in nine minutes. <laughs> um, I think I mean, I think that's. Uh... What the final question was that you sent us, you know, how do we, what do we propose to the World Academy as, as to, you know, the next step of action that we can do as a collective, you know, that we do together creatively and contribute to the change we want to see a reality, be made reality. So I think so. I mean, I'm all, I'm strongly for it. We can propose to uh, the academy that this be created as a project. I mean, I was part years ago. I was part of the new economic theory group, and we had some very productive meetings. Example in Dubrovnik, and then we wrote a joint paper together that was in Cadmus about new economic theory. I mean, we were one of many groups around the world that were trying to you know rewrite the economic textbook, the paradigm shift. You know, which is absolutely imperative and necessary if we're going to survive. So, you know, I think this is the next one because, you know, so many people, that's a global conversation engaged with many different ways already well in motion. You know, everyone's thinking that, yeah, that's, that's the question, you know, um, coming out of COVID, coming out of our current problem, you know, a, a world that's really radically different. But, you know, as, as Frank was saying, you know, you've got to have uh, uh, a much more clear understanding of what that entails. You'd say. So that we can work on it. I think we should. It's, it's a really good project for the Academy. And I think it's a good project for the Academy. And I think if we take the key insights here, right, so that we set it up in that way, right? So what, what Petra was talking about with participation, right? And the art science relationship, if we, if we look at that, that the creative part is not something we're going to do on the side as a performance. In fact, the best performances come from amazing artistic processes that happen between the people creating them. So if we understand that the creativity is baked in from the beginning, right? That the arts and, and the attention to the relationships and, and the creativity, we're baking that in from the beginning and we're allowing it that emergent type of space. But at the same time, uh, I'll work on my metrics, right? Uh, uh, Petra will have her new architecture that, you know, everything's going to be evolving. Um, but can we come up with in that group, you know, some nice models? You know, I want to see Nora Bateson's warm data model, um, Petra's new model for economy, which is just so super cool. <laughs> 
you know, Frank's um, systems change investing model. And in fact, I think what will enable it, enable us to come together is by keeping the space very emergent. But at the same time, everyone keep their individual metrics and data going. Um, mm. And then we can see, um, yeah, how, 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 to build, how to build the strategies and the processes. I, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm not telling people what to do. I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking out loud at, the, at what, could be, what could be the process. I love the, the idea. I think the idea of the future transformation forum is excellent where we would look at um, uh, as some of the other suggestions, suggestions, insights from nature, insights from the indigenous, what, look at what are the processes that are working, identifying the specific changes. Julene, you discussed setting up an online group. Maybe that's one way that we could facilitate uh, the operation of the forum, but I think that's a great idea. Uh, just as a, as, as a general comment, uh, I heard so many wonderful ideas on this panel and it's, uh, it's it, it, and there's many other like us. And it, it, at times you think, how can you possibly integrate all these good ideas? But um, in nature, uh, that's the way nature works. Thousands of different things happen at once, seemingly independent, and it winds up as a coordinated solution. So mm -hmm. we are being, you know, we are we are being guided. Uh, Joseph Campbell uh, said that, um, you know, there's one truth said a thousand different ways, or that the best things can't be said. And, you know, we can't, our minds can't understand everything and how to bring it together, but our hearts know everything. You know, we can know stuff in our heart without being able to say it. So I, I think this, this panel has just been a manifestation of the, the wisdom of nature speaking through each, each one of us. And I love the idea of, um, of that, the Future Transformations Institute. Uh, you know, I, I think that would, we, we could recommend that during the, the session for, for future work tomorrow, yeah. if you all agree. It seems like think, uh, the chat messages. Yeah, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, uh, just a, a little piece about this. I think I think sure it's definitely worthwhile. I think um, because of how we started this this discussion that's brought us together, the urgency of uh, you know the climate chaos and the situation we're in on the you know increasing authoritarianism, shrinking civil society space. I would recommend that there is a. Uh, uh, the first phase might actually to be do some gathering of information, uh, a survey of the field, how many other platforms like this are out there, how do you integrate or set up at least communication uh, nodes or threads between what is happening in other places rather than completely starting from scratch or reinventing. And I know that since we all represent quite a diverse uh, constituency and and little nodes ourselves that that should be fairly doable but I just want to make sure that it's an intentional step of assessment I mean one of the things that I do a lot of is work with activists and social movement folks people who uh, know that there's something wrong we help them articulate a grievance so that they can understand who can actually deliver the change that they want and how it can happen and then also think do the assessment of we know who are the players, uh, the stakeholders, the uh, allies, the opponents, whatever you want to, all the different words people use and the situations both internally and externally for what's happening. And without this actual assessment, the strategic uh, planning, the big picture is not as helpful as it can be. Like um, as an artist, the classic thing is somebody's like, oh, just make me a puppet. Everything's gonna be fine. I'm gonna go parade it out in front of my Capitol building and, and that will change everything. And that's just not true. Like if we start with the tactics, uh, we don't actually, we don't know where we're headed and we might actually get there. <laughs> so I really want to. I, th I think that's that. really important that however we set it up is, is, is most, is working in a, in a new model. And definitely we don't want to be a siloed off group. We know what siloed off knowledge, you know, does, um, right? So we want to have key information flows you know, coming from different groups on the ground. Um, it, culture will probably also come in, into it in terms of your idea will be implemented in one context, my idea will be inter implemented in a different context, right? But definitely having those information flows on the ground so we're not thinking in a siloed off uh, way, um, defining our, our um, participation, you know, as Petra was saying, transformative. Um, and um, 
really putting our, our hearts and brains together in an art science relationship of, of this process. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know if Frank and, wants and to thank and, you. And, and, and one other yeah. thing I'll just add as a facilitator in this crew, um, actually, when we say this work, how do we transform how we work together and how we collect this data? Like, yeah. is it just in a spreadsheet or are we actually gonna be open to um, collecting information in through other ways, music and video yeah. and arts expression yeah. and yeah. acting. And that also, also should be fascinating. Well, yeah. there, there's so many good ideas. Maybe one thing we could do is to try and collectively come up with a proposal for WAS. Uh, I could either write something up or Barry, it was your idea for the forum. If, if you'd like to write up something short uh, and circulate it with us, we can add our ideas and maybe present it to, at, during tomorrow's session. Yeah, so, and uh, what would be the time frame for that? When would I need well, to? It's, um, I mean, if you don't have time, I, I, it's, I'm, I was just thinking of a paragraph. I could just write something and then you all improve it. It's just as a starting point, but it was your idea. So I wanted to give you the idea. Uh, that, yeah. I mean, if you would do that, and I, that would be great. Um, and then we could, we, we could uh, you know, amend it a little or something. Because what time is it that you'd have to present it? Because uh, tomorrow, I think it's, I don't have the schedule in front of me. I think it's about the same time as this, midday. <laughs> I'm here in the U.S., so midday for me, probably not for you. Uh, you know, uh, evening. So, well, yeah. I'm just, um, when when don't you start us? I will. I'll yeah, send some. You can start uh, it off. I'm also wondering, you know, like keeping the structure, you know, information flows, transformative participation, you know, mapping the data, and I'm also wondering if a key part of this forum, you know, for it to be more of, I'm I'm about implementation. I'm sorry, I'm a CEO. <laughs> Um, but um, for us to look at models of initiatives, right? It, you know, best practices, processes that are working, you know, um, working in culture, working in context, right? For us to really get more around implementation. I'm just also feeling in on the insights from the, from the global leadership project that was are doing and, and, and UN are pushing implementation, show us how, show us how, right? So, so for us to also bring that practical element into it, I, you know, would be, would be um, a valuable, I think. Definitely, we don't have a lot of time, we've got to get busy. So what's the practical? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your brilliance, for your contributions, for your being. And um, um, I think we'll, we'll, I guess me, uh, me and Frank will follow up. Frank, you can start by just drafting something, and then maybe we can just all contribute to it and, and, and flesh it out um, and present it tomorrow because, <laughs> because we can. We all <laughs> going with the flow of life. <laughs> Well, thanks to all of you for sharing your wisdom and experience on this panel. It's Thank been you. wonderful. And I hope this is just the beginning. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. We had a really good conversation. Now we can get going, do something together. Yeah, absolutely. Let's make it happen.